Did we lose the mics? Oh, okay. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the April 5th, 2017 Calaveras Council of Government's regular meeting. If you um, are first order after calling to order, um, I'd like just to encourage our staff and our council members to make sure we turn on the mics when we're speaking so that it can be picked up by the videographer. Our first item is the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would stand and please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our first item this evening is the consent agenda. Consent agenda items are expected to be routine and non-controversial and will be acted upon by the council at one time without discussion. Any council member, staff member, or interested party may request that an item be removed from the consent agenda for further discussion. Are there any consent agenda items that the council would like to see pulled? Uh, yes, uh, Chair, uh, item two, item three, item four, item five, and item seven. Okay. Any other council requests? Do we have any public members asking to have any other consent items be removed? Uh, items number one and six currently are available. Um, item six. <laughs> are you serious or just having fun right now? <laughs> Item one, uh, is the available consent item left? Uh, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Agenda? Second. Moved by Council Member Munities, seconded by Council Member Mills. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Approved seven up. Okay, oh. a consent item number two. Uh, Council Member Mills, you've asked for that to be approved. Cool. Yes, uh, Chair, the capital improvement programs, uh, to me, should not just simply be a consent agenda item. Uh, it does state on it possible discussion, and when there is a potential for discussion or further review, I believe those should be on the consent, uh, not on the consent calendar. Uh, in this case, I would like to in the future see a presentation and a discussion before the full board so the members can fully understand the work in progress, the proposed timelines for those projects, and the length of times the projects have been on a list along with the location of earmarked funds, reserve accounts uh, that would pay for the projects. Uh, in the background statement, we see a summary of our funding sources. We think that they are, but we're not sure because member agencies are always updating uh, like they are supposed to, aren't always updating like they're supposed to. And so I'm really, uh, I really want to see a, a more thorough discussion on the projects that we have on our list, uh, much like I saw at the agency, so that we can, we can get a better understanding of uh, who's getting the projects done in a timely manner, what projects in, in essence may end up being deallocated simply because we're not taking care of business in a timely way. So th these are just uh, comments more than anything for future discussion, uh, maybe as an agenda item. Okay. Um, in May, I can schedule a presentation and coordinate with the city and county with their prospective projects, and then I'll start and give an overview of how we programmed in the CIP. Thank you. I'd like to reiterate too that uh, those project lists should be very conclusive in the in the funding, the funding sources, uh, the reserve accounts, what's been earmarked, what hasn't been allocated as an earmarked uh, a funding source, because there's going to be a need to pull from reserve accounts for some of these projects. And if we know what those are and what those demands are going to be, I think it'd be very helpful to us to setting our project goals yes. and our budget for the future. And when we look at agenda item number four. When we get there, I'll show you the reserve um, balances that are identified on the general ledgers. Thank you. Okay. That's all I have on that, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Uh, why don't we just continue in order here since you've asked for the next item? Chair? Yes. Can I also address item two? Yes, you may. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Gary Caldwell, Valley Springs, and 
I really appreciate what you said tonight, Council Member uh, Mills, uh, because I, I think since it's a document for the Council's use, I should think more attention as you're paying should be paid to those items and particularly, you know, you mentioned um, delivery schedules and I think that's very important because I hate to see money unspent and just sit there and not have delivery deadlines met and potentially lose that money or have it a sheet back to the state of the feds. Thank you. I appreciate you keeping in touch with it. Thank you. Any further public comment on item number two? No. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in the overall work program, again, in that agenda submittal, it says that this is a council review discussion, and I agree with that point, so therefore that also should not be a consent agenda item. Uh, it, we get this report out in time uh, because it's required as a quarterly report, uh, and yet we seem to have trouble getting our mid-year financials out in time. I need to, I think we need to ensure COG is working on projects that are important to the city and the county. Uh, and we want to be sure also that we're not uh, engaged in what I call make work planning efforts. Uh, so it's important that the OWP is in alignment with the goals of the city and the county. So I would like to be sure that the public works director for the county has weighed in to ensure that we are in alignment with those, uh, with those project goals. Uh, specifically work element number three, spending nearly $10,000. When, when will this work uh, program be completed? Uh, and report it out to the board would be one of those questions that I personally would have. Any public comment? Or, or staff? Mr. Krovitz, would you like to, to, to address <laughs> my up, point? Mr. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Mills. Um, concerning the overall work program, I am not as fluent with every single item on it. Um, especially some of the ones that are long-range planning efforts that are um, organized and uh, developed by the COG. So uh, I cannot speak to the overall work program development item number three. That's something I think uh, COG staff could probably address. Um, I can address um, in a little bit more detail if you are interested. Item seven, the regional transportation plan um, item 15, the countywide pavement management, which is actually should be titled county asset management, not pavement management. Um, item 16, the SR49 commercial gateway corridor study. I'm assuming that's the San Andreas one. Am I correct? Thank you. Um, I can discuss in more detail, of course, number 18, which is the wagon trail PNED. And as you know, I think that PNED is now completed and we are moving towards PSNE and right away. Thank you. You need anything else? Well, the primary concern is I want to be sure that uh, we have a conversation and that the, that the COG is working on those projects that we consider critically important to the infrastructure of the county. So it is, it is a matter of just being sure that the alignment is there and that we have the projects on the list that meet our goals as well. Um, are you asking for um, a little bit more flushed out in a different location on what these work elements are? This is an initial discussion, but as we go forward, yes, I would be requesting that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions from the council no. for thank you. Public Works? Thank you. Okay. And item number four. Moving on to agenda item number four, this is the mid-year financial reports. As a board member, again, I'm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the idea of having uh, this in my hands in April. Uh, as we're now 90 days further into the budget, and it becomes very difficult to do course corrections um, and undertake uh, so close to the end of the year. So I've never been in a public or a private sector a business where uh, I see this long a delay in reporting out of mid-year, so the presentation of a mid-year to the board, I think, is important to the understanding of whether we are meeting our budget goals in preparation for discussion on next year's budget, where those adjustments will need to be discussed in the current year, and the effects of those adjustments on next year's budget goals. Now, if you want to look, uh, you'll look at uh, Fund 6100 uh, in the list uh, in that section. It says uh, 1006 cash and treasury, 588000 and then uh, the 3002 fund balance on the reserve to 514,000 and then fund 6110 you can add up those items there's an additional 2 million 
it, it shows it's not encumbered. I don't, I'm not certain uh, that we're allocated or how we're doing this or there's some kind of reserve account fund number with it. But with any capital improvement project, the fund should be showing as non-suspendable, restricted, committed, assigned, or unassigned for specific projects listed. So to assist in that point, I would refer to pages 139 and 140 of your agenda packet that's listed to show uh, restricted and unrestricted cash. This is in the audit report. Uh, the board should be able to know from what accounts funds are going and uh, are being used to complete projects and when the expectation is we'll be using those funds. Uh, I only see a restricted of 747000 last year on page 156, and that left the rest of it exposed. As you recall, in previous history, the state is very, has been very good when they get into a crunch of taking unreserved funds and making it to their own personal benefit. So we want to be sure that our funds uh, are, are actually accounted for, allocated, and earmarked to the specific projects or goals that we have in mind so that there is no potential that we could lose those funds in, in the reserves. So we did transfer 185,000 uh, in uh, 6100 to 61, or from 6110 to 6100 in those in the last six months. So I'm questioning whether this was done in the multiples over the last six months, and was there any board action to approve it? Yes, there was. This is based on the overall work program and the budget of LTF, um, and it totals three hundred and seventy one thousand nine hundred and ninety dollars mm -hmm. and we do it in increments so the 185 was the partial um, allocation mm -hmm. and we've had some staffing issues so I'll be following up with the remaining allocation transfers as the year goes by the LTF fund receives revenue on a monthly basis um, so we have to wait till the fund has you know built up enough and then we transfer the allocations also in 6110, um, which is the LTF account, um, you were talking about the high um, balance. Um, this will be needed when we receive the um, transit claim, which will be coming before the council in um, May. Okay. Um, the 6100, that's our operating account. Right. So this is where we're paying all of our bills, payroll, um, all of the overall work program project expenditures i just uh, the point is is i want to be sure that the the uh, liquid assets the funds necessary to do 6100 are actually all we have there or a little bit of a buffer in other words we should be de declaring about a 90-day operational buffered and buffer and funding so that we're not carrying an inordinate amount of cash into that account and just holding it there uh, thinking of spending it out over six months or nine months or a year so in the past, we did a cash flow analysis, and if you look at the balance of the 573, that includes a 309,000 operational um, cushion. So we can go through in a three-month period over $300,000 in cash paying out contracts. So the board previously has approved this um, fund does contain a $300,000 $9,000 um, operating reserve. Yes, and I just want to be sure that we're not carrying too much reserve in that account, uh, knowing what, what our demands are going to be over the next nine months, or six to nine months okay. at this point. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Any further comment on item number four, the meager financial reports and budget to actual? Jeff Krovitz, Public Works County. Um, <clears throat> this is a general comment. If there are any LTF savings um, at the end of the year, uh, what is the uh, plan for distribution or cash carry or whatever at the end of the year? If we have sal if the cog has salary savings or a project forbid heaven forbid comes in under budget. Okay. Good point. So noted. Thank you. Any further public comment? Okay. Director Mills, how about item number five as well? Item number five, uh, what I would like to see here is, is to, to be sure that the training activities that are being completed by staff, uh, to be sure that we have ensured a return on investment, possibly even a report out uh, on some of those training activities, what benefit that they have to COG. Uh, I specifically would refer to page 39 of the agenda packet where there was a quite a bit of uh, training that was done in this last reporting period. 
Uh, it's not that it's training is negative. I, I'm very much in favor of having training, but I want to be sure that we we do understand the, the cost and be sure there's a cost benefit analysis with that. Krovitz, you asked for item number six to be pulled. And I apologize, is there any public comment on item number five beyond what Director Mills has asked? Good evening, Kathy Topol. Who am I? Kathy Topol, Common Ground Senior Services. Um, I also had a question on that uh, reimbursement form. It appears that um, the executive committee gets paid lunch to go out to lunch. And I kind of had a question about that. You know, is, is that in the budget that, you know, when you come together as the executive committee, the COG pays for your lunch? So that was a question I had on that. Thank you. to figure out which item. Yeah, I'll, I can bring the information back. Okay. All right. Um, any further public comment on item number five? Seeing none, Mr. Krovitz, would you like to discuss item number six? Yeah, your last item is page 41. You'll be able to find it. Um, item six, release of draft amended policies and procedures as recommended by the Triennial Performance Audit. I have... Um, some concerns about this item and that was the reason I asked for it to be pulled. Um, I applaud the efforts to update the policies and procedures under which the COG and the Council operate. Um, I think there are a number of items on this that need uh, review, discussion, and updating. Um, as I read through these changes, um, it appeared that a lot of work has gone into modifications and proposed modifications to this. Um, yet I didn't see any kind of discussion in the staff report in terms of how the changes, the proposed changes, related to the uh, recommendations of the triennial audit. It seemed like it, the changes were outside of that scope. So that was my first concern. I wasn't sure how the specific changes within this policy and procedures guideline addressed the recommendations of the triennial audit. That's number one. Number two, I also have some concern about um, the procedure for review and updating of this policy and procedures manual. Um, uh, the JPA and the policy and procedures manual currently are not very explicit about uh, policies and procedures for review modification to the policies and procedures. And I think that bears addressing. Um, some suggestions I have may be that um, uh, suggested P&Ps, first of all, should be directed by the Council for changes um, and potentially reviewed by a number of the committees that have been formed um, as part of the COG jurisdictions, such as the Executive Management Group, the TAC, the SysTAC, the ITC, any of these. Um, so I'm curious to know what the policy and procedure is for the re vision of policies and procedures. And my recommendation is that before we go through um, as a group and revise policy and procedures, we have a public vetting process or at a minimum a vetting process that is comprised of the committees identified um, in the organizational structure of the COG. That's it. Thank okay. you. Questions? It's a great comment. It's a public comment, so thank you. Any other public comment on item number six? Supervisor Director Mills, you asked for item number seven. Yes, uh, item 7.1, our unapportioned fund balance will drop from what it's saying there by over 750,000 next year. I think this is going to require some serious discussion on how it's going to impact our 17-18 budget and the goals that uh, maybe we even end up deferring some. Uh, 
it, is it possible that we aren't doing actuals here so we're doing guesstimated reports because I don't see a lot of actuals here because we just don't have a full accurate report. So I'm, I'm really concerned when I see something other than actuals in a list. So only the first column is actuals, everything else is something else and it, to me it's a guesstimation until I can see that there's a validation those numbers are correct. So I'm concerned about the 750,000 um, and possibly are we prepared to lose federal funding if Governor Brown and the legislature move forward with their idea of a sanctuary state. So what impacts that might have also could be uh, played into our discussion at a future point. This is a report that comes from the auditor controller. Uh -huh. It does not come from the COG. And, and it's also a requirement of the TDA Act. So every fe February, the county auditor um, releases an estimate. And in this case, she's also updated her estimate for 167 based on um, the State Board of Equalization's estimates. And in these estimates, she's updating to the best of her knowledge through the financial system that she oversees these numbers and then she gives the new estimate for 1718 and we work off of that and if there's any um, um, updating she sends us a letter and we provide it to the council and the jurisdictions no I do understand that uh, it's just the, the point is is estimates are exactly that and we need to always understand that that's a variable that that sometimes can play not well in our in our final results if we're not cognizant that it is an estimate only that was my point. Also then moving on to 7.2, if, if Chair doesn't mind. All right. uh, considering what's highlighted here, is there an expectation that we'll have some incomplete reports or has there been some kind of problem in the past regarding reporting processes that has driven us to highlight these yes. points? Yes, we have been on a um, late list before, so we put this under correspondence so that both jurisdictions know that these are due. And in this case, the 1314 grant year, there was 36,697 available um, that wasn't allocated or programmed by the city or county. So where we're having uh, an inability to, to uh, provide a correct or a complete report in a timely manner, I would trust that the COG staff would reach back to the council and be sure that we're aware of that oh, because that is putting us at risk. Yep, mm -hmm. we do on a okay. continual basis. All right, I just wanted to have it on the radar screen as well. Yeah. And that'll feed into some additional items at the end of the agenda. Yes, I'm aware of that. Thank you. Yes. That concludes our consent agenda items. We, we need to at this point, I, we have a motion to approve the balance of the consent agenda items two through seven. So, so move by Council Member Minities. Second. Second by Council Member Toffinelli. All in favor? Aye. 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 Public comment. Public comment should be five minutes per person. Comments shall be limited to items that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council and not on the posted agenda. Do we have any public comment this evening? Mr. Caldwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gary Caldwell, Valley Springs. First of all, I, uh, I'd like to uh, express my appreciation to the interim executive director for taking the time to help me uh, with this agenda packet because let's let's correct that we haven't appointed one yet 350 I beg your pardon we have not appointed an interim executive director yet oh you've, I'm sorry you've been assisted by our administrative services officer Ms. Raggio <laughs> then uh, helping me uh, go through that uh, not necessarily page by page but I had a few questions and comments and she took some time to uh, answer those questions and to uh, absolve any concerns I had with, with respect to my comments, and I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I'd like to uh, have item number nine, uh, a presentation by Richardson and Company with request for acceptance by the council of the fiscal year 2015-16 annual TDA financial audits. I'd like to take the chance to um, introduce Brian Nash. Um, annually, TDA claimants are required to conduct financial audits. Richardson and Company is our independent auditor, and he's here to give you a presentation on 1516 financial audits for the Calabrese Council of Governments, the county, and the city. 
So good evening. Um, you should have several uh, financial statements that, that we uh, uh, issue, the, the Council of Governments itself, the County Transit Fund, and then there's a City of Angels uh, Transportation Development Act Fund. Um, there's also a management letter uh, for the Council of Governments, and there's a uh, letter of required disclosures to a governing body. I'll cover um, what's in those letters uh, in my presentation. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that management's responsible for this financial statements. Our responsibility is to provide our opinion based on our audit. Um, the opinions in all the financial statements are clean. So, um, you know, there's nothing, nothing unusual, no modified opinions. Um, I'd like to point out kind of the biggest issue of the audit right up front here, which you'll see in our management letter and in our compliance reports, which is um, the, the accounting for both the transit fund and the council of governments um, needed, needed improvement. Um, this has been really an ongoing issue. Um, to give you a little bit of background for the new uh, board members, the City of Angels did the uh, accounting for the COG the first year we uh, did our audit. This is our fifth year. Um, it got transferred to the county. I believe there's a $20,000 contract for the county auditor controller's office to do the accounting. Um, so this is the fourth year that the county auditor controller's office has been doing the accounting. Um, we would have expected the accounting to, to be cleaned up by now, but it's still just that they haven't quite got there. Um, as I said in my, my agenda, I, did, I gave a, a, a brief outline. There's 20, there's 27 audit adjustments for CalCog and 14 audit adjustments for the transit fund, for the, the county transit fund. So. Really, that makes it difficult to make sure we're doing a good job because we're really auditing moving numbers. Um, the, the county auditor is definitely capable of doing a good job on the accounting. Um, I think maybe the issue has been not enough staffing, not enough time. <clears throat> the, you know, as I mentioned, I think there was a $20,000 fee. I think only $7,500 was charged to the COG for accounting because there just wasn't enough time to spend to, to use that entire fee. Um, and I, one of the reasons I heard was due to the fires, a lot of the issues due to the fires. So, you know, the, the county has a lot of issues to deal with. And so the auditor controller is really a, a busy person. And um, I'm not sure what kind of bench strength that the county has on accounting. I've never spoken to anyone else at the county besides auditor controller. So if you read our management letter, there's just a whole bunch of related items. Here's ways to, to make sure the accounting's done better. Um, and my, my final comment is um, if the if the chart of accounts, so the, the chart of accounts is all the accounts in, the, in the, the accounting system, those should match how the financial statements are reported. Currently, the chart of accounts um, that the county has um, doesn't have all the accounts that we need uh, to be able to report the numbers correctly in the financial statements. So that's kind of the step one. If that can't be corrected, uh, really, you can't do accounting appropriately. You can't show classifications correctly. You can't you know, show the right, the, the revenues or expenses are reported. Um, spent in the right category. So there are a lot of, a lot of changes that need to occur before the auditor controller can really do a good job. It'll take some time, and apparently there wasn't enough time this year. So my, my recommendation is if there, there must be a, um, a little, little bit more time spent doing accounting for the COG, um, and if, that, if the county doesn't have time to do that, then my recommendation would be to hire a bookkeeper, and, and I, I believe the, the COG does have QuickBooks, you know, that could be used to do accounting internally. And I think um, Director Mills was talking about the reporting, how, how long it was uh, since the, the numbers have been reported. Um, the delay in the reporting and the accuracy of how uh, items are reported are affected by this issue. So this would kind of, I think it could speed up how, how amounts could be reported to the, bo to the board. Um, if something was, uh, was changed, if a bookkeeper was hired, I did give a few uh, names of bookkeepers that we come in contact with that do other council of governments or other TDA accounting um, to Melissa Raggio. So that's something I think really does need to be uh, taken care of. Um, we just today received an RFP um, for the, the, the next uh, series of years. And um, in the current situation, our fee would be much higher than it was when we originally bid. Um, we had to bid extra, bill extra due to how much additional accounting it took. And you know, it's really hard on my staff. They have to do a lot of overtime. Um, they're already working 10-hour days, and then they have to fit in extra hours to, to clean up the, the accounting. 
So I think that's enough on the accounting. Um, if there's anybody that has any, any detailed questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Otherwise, yes. Um, does the does the auditor's office get a copy of your recommendations? And yes, they do. These, all of this information. They, yes, we do. And we also had a kickoff meeting in August, I believe it was, July. where July, where we discussed some of the things that could be done to improve the accounting. You have we got a meeting one on one with her. And yes, we're all at the table. We are all at the table. And, and I, I think the issue is just not enough time. Not enough time. Not enough staffing in the, in the auditor controller's office. So that's my that's my feeling after looking at what's happening over four years. Because the auditor controller, she's very good. She knows what she's doing. So I know she'd get the, the numbers right if she could. It's just that not enough time. Not enough staff. Has she billed consistently over the past four years the full amount of the contract? Yes, she has. But this is the first year she only charged us. For year 1560. Yes. For 1560. Because there's a lot of recommendations here, and apparently they're ongoing and have been for several years. Yeah. I'm getting adjusted to what you've written here, and I have some concerns over it. So. Um. <coughs> yes. Mr. Nash, it's good to see you again. Nice to see you. CCWD. The last time we talked. Yes. Um, I really appreciate the uh, the effort that you're trying to take to uh, to bring this about, and maybe the, the COG needs to discuss the possibility of bringing a bookkeeper on board, as you recommend, to, to kind of be sure that we've got this process cleaned up, because this does affect us in many many ways when we don't have and uh, we have these deficiencies that are that are notable and over a long period of time, and they will affect us in, in many ways that we sometimes don't understand. So I really do appreciate your willingness to step up and make these statements it's difficult this is to do. this is the strongest uh, statement i've made to date um, i think i well they're pretty kicked strong. it up a notch i have them highlighted yes. here um, so Can the, the situation is pretty pretty grim it's pretty serious situation that needs to be corrected uh, we're borderline not independent due to how much uh, bookkeeping we have to do for the cog and for the the county transit fund um, we're not, we're, we're, we still think we could be independent with the approvals that are done by the COG and the county, but, but it's really, you know, more than an auditor should do to get the numbers correct for reporting to the council. Specifically in closing out the books or the closing process for end of year, and that's where you spent a lot of time was coming, yes. going back over the, the incomplete or trying to finish them out so that you had them correct. So I, I see that on page 126 of our agenda packet that you know it went into detail, but also page 221 says an increase of 13,938 to the contracts for additional staff time to outside the scope of work in order to complete uh, COG and county financial audits. To me, that's uh, that, that needs is, to be addressed. That is our cost. That is not yes. any profit. That is just our payroll and benefits. So and it's I, pretty substantial. I could think that we could laterally transfer a bookkeeper for a short period of time at the end of the year to kind of help close this out might be an answer, but I think the COG board needs to have this as an agenda item that we can discuss how we're going to deal with it and, and bring it into compliance. Um, was, there, was there a cost last year also similar to that? There was, last year there was a, I think we did, there was an extra charge just due to implementing GASB 68 for oh, pension okay. plan. Yeah. Yeah. County auditor, she would need to make adjustments to her general ledger. Mm -hmm. So it would be her setting up the additional funds needed to segregate those um, adjustments. So to give you an example, there's there's certain revenues that are reported. You know, the, there's local transportation fund, state transit assistance fund, PTM, ISCA. There's different types of revenue sources that need to be tracked and, and be able to be compared to the expenses. And there's no. Uh, not all of those revenue sources are set up in the general ledger with separate accounts. And I th think it might be partially due to not wanting to change the chart of accounts of the county because it, it then sets up accounts that can be used in other funds yeah. of the county. So when you have 30, you know, 25 to 30 departments to go in and, you know, make um, specific changes. Council, I'd like to, our council, legal council raised his hand. I'd like to turn the opportunity. Oh, well, thank you. I just to point out that the, um, the joint fire spirit that created the COG seems to suggest that the uh, uh, these services should be provided by one of the member agencies. So we have to look at it. It's, it's been required in the oh. GPA. But 
Um, a motion to the city. <laughs> provide the service. This is uh, a presentation. If it, this is I a think it's already been requested that we look at this as an agenda. Yeah, I think that if, if anything, if we need to, we could possibly pull the board to uh, to discuss this at a future agenda item and a future meeting that we can uh, fully understand the ramifications I, I, and, and start to wrap our head around how we're going to uh, to bring this into alignment. Because to me, this is the worst audit that I've ever seen in my career. And I've been in big corporate as well as agency, so I'm not I'm not trying to make this worse than it is, but it is serious, and I think we need to treat it as what it is. Do we have a sense of how 1617 uh, is looking so far? So from the county auditor? Right. We're processing our um, work the same. She hasn't made any adjustments to the jail. Okay, so we are looking at similar type issues for 1617. Yeah, if, if there's no control from the city, mm -hmm. county, or cog staff, we need to work through the county auditor for her to set up the general ledger. So what Brian is suggesting is a bookkeeper would come in, print out all of our GL for that year, write up the recommended adjustments and submit them to the county auditor, and then she would make those adjustments and enter them into the general ledger. So we would be reconciling a more detailed general ledger on the council's behalf directly and utilizing the, the county as the, the, the master holder of the funds, and they would actually have an aggregated accounting structure as they have now, yeah. that we would reconcile our more detailed GL to satisfy the accounting for our yeah. And in the Correct. discussions in the future, we need to remember the LTF funds and STA funds have to be held within the county treasury. It's part of the TDA Act, okay. so you would not be able to move that out of the county itself. Right. And, and I, I concur with uh, our council that uh, that needs to be possibly in the discussion as to how we might amend the JPA to uh, to, to move forward. So, okay. yeah, I, I'm agreeing. Mr. Nash, are you then to moving continue. on to additional parts of your presentation? Yes. So, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm going to touch on a few of the highlights of the financial statements and other issues for each entity. So, for the the council of governments. Um, you know, these numbers are nine months old now, so I'm not going to belabor them, but uh, something that I always focus on is, you know, what happened to the spendable money. So the unrestricted net position uh, or unrestricted fund balance. So that if you look at the Council of Governments, if you're new, if you're used to looking at full accrual financial statements like a water district, it's a little different. There's, there's modified accrual numbers. That's the general fund. That's the fund that the budget applies to. The only thing that's in those funds are short-term assets and liabilities. There's a, an adjustment to, to record um, items at, on the full accrual basis, and then there's government-wide financial statements that shows those numbers. So the pension liability, for example, gets dropped into the government-wide financial statements. So for the governmental fund, the general fund that the budget applies to, the unrestricted fund balance increased 131000 to 497000 um, Full accrual unrestricted net position increased 147000 so pretty similar. Uh, so project expenses slowed. That's, that was the main reason for the increase. Um, the remaining restricted funds on the, the balance sheet of the Council of Governments were PTMISDA and CALIMA money, so state monies that were restricted for future bus, bus purchases and bus stop repairs. Um, the local transportation fund, this is a fund that's in the back of the financial statements as a private purpose trust fund. The net position increased 246,000 to 982,000 at June 30, 16. Um, that was largely due to no street money being allocated to the county. Um, the CalCog took 154,000 more that year, and the county transit took 105,000 more that year than the previous year. Um, one thing to keep in mind is the funding priority is council of government for planning and administration then transit, then streets and roads. So it has to be that, it's statutorily that order. Um, you'll find that in the Transportation Development Act. That's the law that created the, that revenue source. Um, the STAF fund, you'll notice that it had a deficit fund balance of, of 44,000. So there's more expenses than revenues. And so that has to be made up in 1617. And so we've had, I've had some con uh, conversations with staff and so, and also the county, um, the person at the county that's responsible for accounting of that fund. And so basically what's gonna happen is you're gonna have to reduce the 
amount available to allocate below the revenue estimate to make up for that negative fund balance of 44,000. So there'll be less STF available, but then there'll be, you know, the, the county transit could take more LTF instead, but that would then make less money available for streets and roads. Um, there was a, let's see, there was a revised claim, I guess, that already was approved for 119,000 for uh, the county. The county transit fund did have a deficit as well. So on the county transit fund, one of the th things that were significantly different this year than, than in the previous year was there was a transit manager assigned to the fund. And because of the transit manager being assigned to the fund, there's payroll, and then there's payroll liabilities that were added to the fund. They were pretty substantial. Um, $159,000 of payroll-related liabilities had to be accrued back into the transit fund to, to come along with the, with the transit manager. Those, those include pension liability, post-retirement health care benefits liability, and compensated absences to vacation and sick leave liability. So that added a lot of expense to the fund and there was an increase in the expenses due to a one-time adjustment to bring those expenses back into the fund. Previously, those liabilities were recorded in another county fund. So they, got, they were shifted from one county fund to, a, to the transit fund. Um, also because of the, the, the overhead allocation of the county um, relies on payroll, more overhead was allocated, the, the, uh, the overhead allocation, the, the normal overhead allocation, uh, more of that was allocated to the fund because there's more salaries in the fund. So there was $425,000 of bus purchases in the transit fund and that resulted in, I was looking at the maintenance expenses, um, those declined towards the end of the year as, as you would expect because of those bus purchases. Um, but one of the things you, that uh, you know, we've noticed is the, the maintenance was shifted from the contractor to the county um, expecting a lot of savings and, and really those haven't materialized up through the end of this year, this fiscal year. Uh, maybe with those bus pur purchases, those savings would uh, materialize. There's a fair revenue ratio requirement for the LTF fund, it's 10%, or for the uh, transit fund, it's 10%. Um, the actual was 7.5%, but uh, one of the things I mentioned in the footnote is that there was that one-time adjustment to bring in those liabilities that inflated the expenses. So I, I showed the fair revenue ratio without that one-time adjustment and it was 8.37%. So it's below the 10% required. And so in the current year, there's no no effect due to that uh, failing the fair revenue ratio, but as you go forward, the, the way the TDA works is the first year is a grace year, the second year you measure the amount of the shortfall, the third year, if it happens again, there's, there's a penalty. So the COG cannot allocate that amount of LTF to the fund. So if you had a million dollars of expenses, you couldn't claim a million dollars of LTF, you'd have to reduce it for the amount of the shortfall on the fair revenue ratio. So if the, you know, that's in the short term, that's really not a big deal, but in the long term, um, if the expenses stayed at that level, the county would have to probably come up with that money to pay for the, the services at that level. Um, I did a quick calculation, it was around 18,000 was the shortfall during 15, 16. So I, I noticed in the response from management to the, there, that's a TDA compliance finding that, that the fair revenue ratio wasn't met and there's a response from the county and it talks about some of the changes they're gonna make to the operations that should, should help that, that fair revenue ratio, but that's something to keep an eye on because it, you know, as, on a short-term basis, not a problem. Long-term basis, if it, keeps, it continues happening, then somebody's gonna have to, to fund some of those expenses and the someone is gonna be the county. So, um, one of the things that, uh, that I wanted to mention is the numbers did change quite a bit in the financial statements, so the operating expenses does affect a lot of the statistics that are reported. That's something that should be considered. Maybe those uh, performance reports need to be adjusted and uh, resubmitted. And so we already talked about the internal control finding in the compliance report. So does anybody have any questions on the COG or the transit fund? Would uh, like me to go into more detail? Council? I think uh, we're gonna get into transit later on in the meeting, so we'll probably discuss it more fully there. His question is related to the 1516 performance. Yes, and I'd be out of here. Any, okay. 
Okay. Um, so the, there was a, an audit of the, the money that got uh, allocated to the city, City of Angels, and there was no problems in our audit on that one. It, uh, we checked the expenses, they looked okay. Okay, just a couple more things required disclosures to a governing body. One is significant estimates, uh, the fair value of the cash and investments in the county pools an estimate, the cost reimbursement grant receivables are based on, on the, uh, the estimated expenses, the amount of expenses that are qualifying. Um, that, that is subject to change if uh, um, a grantor disallowed some expenses. The compensated absences liability, the pension liability is based on a um, valuation by a, an actuary and the asset lives depreciation are estimated. So the, the scope of our audit was consistent with our engagement letter other, other than the additional bookkeeping that we had to do. Um, there's no other difficulties encountered um, other than that. Uh, no disagreements with management, no issues discussed prior to our retention, no, like, no accounting uh, result that was required by, by management to hire us, and uh, no consultations with other auditors that we're aware of. So with that, my pre formal presentation is done. I'd be happy to stay here and answer more questions. I do have one question that's regarding the Gatsby. Uh, <coughs> we, are we due fairly soon for a, an audit on our Gatsby's, like Gatsby 68? Um, so the, the Gatsby 68, the way that works, the um, CalPERS does the, uh, computes the numbers. And so those are available every year. You have to pay for them, um, but they're available to, uh, to derive using your percentage of the overall cost sharing pool and they're available for your financial statements. So that's not something that We'll have to um, do you hire audit. a separate actuary for so CalPERS prepares what's needed. Um, although it does need some some computation, they don't take it all the way to the to the degree that need, that's needed for your um, financial statements. But there's not like a formal valuation like you would for a post retirement healthcare benefit uh, where you need to hire an actuary. That does, that's not necessary. Yeah, my question it resolves again around an agency that had to do that. So just wanted to be sure that we weren't in okay. that mode. Anything else? Thank you. Any public questions? Ms. Colwick. <clears throat> Gary Caldwell, Valley Springs. After listening to the report here, um, certainly was comprehensive, and I'm not an accountant, so a lot of it, you know, but certainly uh, appears to have uncovered a, a number of items. And uh, I wanted to uh, ask, uh, given the uh, bullets on uh, page 131 and uh, 130, there's a one bullet on page 130. There's uh, seven bullets total there. And at the end of the bullets, there's a paragraph <laughs> that starts out, the situation has not improved over the past several years. And I'm wondering what action the Council is prepared to take tonight after uh, hearing Council Member Toffanelli say that uh, he's got some concerns. Um, the representative from Richardson and Company here says that problems could be serious. Council Member Mills says he's never seen an audit this bad. Um, something obviously needs to be done, and the uh, the uh, paragraph I started to refer to, it says, if the county does not have staffing necessary to help the council establish a gap compliant chart of accounts and assist the council to close the books in an effective and timely manner, we believe the council should consider terminating the contract with the county for accounting services. What is your action with respect to that recommendation there? What we discussed this evening is- I beg your we, pardon? What we discussed this evening was that as a council, we would be bringing this back for an agenda item, for a future agenda item, that we would be considering, and that's when we discussed the concept of having an independent bookkeeper hired by the council with an independent chart of accounts, meeting the auditing requirements that we have, and then you still utilizing the county to contain and bank the money for us as required by TDA uh, guidelines. So the county would have a more master aggregated summary of the funds that would be reconciled to the COGS general ledger that meets the auditing requirements of the uh, Richardson and Company's recommendations. We did make that comment this evening that this will be coming back for a future agenda item to be discussed. 
It's going to be a future item. Right. There's no action item tonight to you be have taken. To this is a report of the audit itself. This is a report of the audit hearing. We have to bring it That's back. It. We agendize it. But he, he's correct in what we discussed. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, the, the county pays all the invoices that come in and go out to them, and they, they retain the funds. So we're talking about a separate thing to, to the audit. Because I hate to see. Uh, it says on that last paragraph I referenced, the situation I improved over the past several years. I hate to have Richardson and company repeat the same comments over and over and over. You're paying the tab for that. You know, you need to take care of the problem, not continue to pay Richardson and company to tell you you have a problem. Thank you. So, anything else? Is there any other public comment? Mr. Nash, thank you very much for coming up and for your presentation. Thank you, thank you Mr. Nash. Thank you. Agenda <clears throat> item number 10. Well, we need to vote on the acceptance of these audits. They're due to Caltrans. We approved a 90 day extension and we're currently five days late, so we need to get these audits out to Caltrans, the state, and the other programs. The request for acceptance. Okay. No matter what happens here, we still need to approve this. So I just oh, want yeah. everybody to understand this is not a, a time to vote. Oh, hope that you don't like it or whatever. This, yeah. We'll have that discussion later. Right. So I would move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Approve so no. I think you must. <clears throat> Agenda item number 10, authorizing the appointment of Melissa Raggio as the interim director at the currently approved salary range. The executive management committee did get together and after discussion, we uh, recommend the appointment of Melissa Raggio to serve as the interim director for the council, Gallagher's Council of Governments effective immediately. Um, as Melissa Eads resigned from the council on March 1st with the last day of March 31st, uh, we are fortunate, I think, and, uh, and blessed actually to have a staff member who has been with the Council of Governments now for over five years, um, deeply involved with the financial transactions, and this is a very heavy financial agency with respect to managing and, and understanding both the ABC terms that we have to deal with, uh, the alphabet soup as it were, but also somebody who understands how these funds interrelate and how to work with staff, both here at the COG level itself as well as the county and, and city. Um, Ms. Raju has been Again, our administrative services officer now for a number of years has done a very credible job in that, and uh, I think we would be very fortunate to have her step in at this, during this time as our interim. Discussion by council. I would concur. I think that it is very critical that we have succession planning and not be put into position as the county recently did with their CAO. Um, that, uh, that is very important that, that we retain that institutional knowledge amongst the staff and uh, that has a value, that definitely has a value, and it will be uh, giving us stability and continuity as we go forward, so I look forward to you taking that position in the interim until we can make our decision. Thank you. Well, I don't know, motion? did you fill out a resume? <laughs> um, I didn't Background see it check. here, so I'm not yeah. sure. Uh, no, I'm happy to serve the council in this temporary um, appointment. I am not um, interested in the full-time uh, Mr. Chair, um, I would move this item. Second. Okay. Item has been moved and seconded. Is there further council comment? Public, public comment. <clears throat> Jeff Grovitz, Public Works Director County. Um, I think you couldn't find a more qualified person to act as interim executive director. Um, my concern is I see what is happening to my staff where um, I have promoted uh, my business administrator to deputy director. I now find her doing three jobs um, while we are waiting to backfill. And so my concern really is that if uh, Ms. Raggio is operating as both executive director and administrator, um, is there time for all that? Um, and Will we still be able to process claims? Will we still be able to move ahead with the myriad of projects under, um, under our work plan? 
So um, while I think she's very qualified and I would support it, I'm also concerned with um, capacity. Thank you. Any further public comment? Council, we have a motion and a second on the table. Call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Approve 7 out. Congratulations, Council. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. I don't know if we just turned you into a slave or not, but. Well, yeah. <laughs> Agenda item number 11, appointment of a recruitment committee comprised of the chair, county, and city members to oversee the recruitment of the executive director. Staff is asking for the appointment of a recruitment committee. Um, past recruitments conducted by the COG have utilized the assistance of a recruitment committee comprised of members of the council representing the public, city, and county seats. The purpose is to provide direction and support to the COG staff, to review and direct staff on the development and implementation of the schedule, Review the current job description, salary schedule, and recruitment flyer. Review prospective candidates, conduct interviews, update the council with top candidates for full council interviews, and negotiate as directed by the full council. We um, have watched, uh, we're not a large budget organization. Uh, I think our staff does a very good job of trying to work within the means that they're provided. Um, we do not have the resources to go out and hire a headhunting firm. On the other hand, we do have a number of resources as a COG to reach out and look for uh, future COG directors. And so I think uh, the staff's recommendation of the historical process of utilizing a city member, a council member from the city, from the county, and the chair uh, should work very well. Uh, council discussion. Well, I was involved in, in the last time when we recruited Melissa, um, and we did the similar type thing. We didn't have the funding either to go out and, and hire a firm to, to do that. So we solicited in many, there's many avenues that you can do this in um, and for very little costs and get it out there, what we're looking for. Um, we were very fortunate when Melissa came. Um, she was local. Although we did have some applicants from, I think, Seattle and, uh, Florida. and Florida, yeah, too, so that we did interview. Uh, but it was a it was a very good process and it worked the same type of thing as being proposed here at the time. So um, I'm I'm I would like to see it done this way. Okay. So we do need one member um, from the county mm -hmm. supervisor, one member from the city, um, and then our chair would be the citizen member. You were in the process the last time? Would you like to do it again? Just because I'll, I'll do it again. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. do it for the county. It just helps to keep that. Dad said speak up. I can't hear you. <laughs> um, I will um, put my name in the hat for the city. Um, okay. If the board supports that. So we have a, a recommendation consensus being brought forward, do we have a motion to ask Supervisor Cofinelli, Angels Camp, Council Member Amanda Pomodor, and have the chair serve as the recruitment committee? I would so move. A second. Second. Okay. Any further council comment? Public. So I'm going to ask the council first. Any public comment? Seeing none, call for the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Seven out. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Matt. <coughs> Number 12, a motion to be made to approve the increase of the credit card limit for the interim executive director to $2,000. Um, this I understand to have the ability for um, the executive director to manage the, the business of the, of the COG on a monthly basis without exceeding the limits of the card. Yes. And I don't anticipate a, any, you know, when you're going to trainings, you need your Cal card. Right. Um, I don't anticipate in using it, but per the policies and procedures, the executive director's Cal card limit is $2,000. This is a minute order asking the council to authorize the increase. I currently have a card. The limit is $1,000. That's the item before you. Okay. 
Any council comment? Yes, absolutely. I don't think that, uh, that Ms. Rogers should be hampered or hindered in any way and have the full benefits of the position while you're holding that position. So, yes, absolutely. Any public comment? So moved. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 13. This is actually presented by the interim director, mm -hmm. comma. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. This item is a resolution we usually bring before the council annually in June with the approval of our final overall work program. It authorizes the executive director or their designee to sign contracts, invoices, the overall work program agreement, or requests for reimbursement um, from Caltrans in the state. So this would authorize me to sign on your behalf. The council discussion. We have a motion. So moved. So moved. Second. Second by Councilmember Palmer. Any public comment? Call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Approved. Agenda item number 14, authorization to the interim director to execute a letter of support for the State Route 4 Wagon Trail Federal Lands Grant Program. Interim director. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this item would authorize um, the execution of a letter of support for the State Route 4 Wagon Trail Federal Lands Grant Program. Um, I think this is the third time COG has applied for this grant. Um, this would leverage $16.7 million for this project. Um, the Board of Supervisors also approved um, a letter of support at their March 28th meeting. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Also, the project lead for the um, future phases um, would be Mr. Krovitz from the Public Works Direct Department. So moved. Okay. Second. Second. Second by Council Member Herman. Herman. Any further council discussion? Any public comment? Mr. Krovitz. Jeff Krovitz, Public Works Director County. Um, uh, Wagon Trail, I think, is the single largest project currently on our docket um, to the benefit of both city and county. Um, and I do support the, uh, the letter campaign that we're currently involved in. Um, I brought a letter to the board on the 28th, which they approved, and I've been working with Supervisors Oliveira and Mills on uh, supporting letters from other agencies, um, and I know that the COG is working specifically on getting grants from public lands agencies, such as the Forest Service. Um, this grant is a grant for in support of construction. So there's $16.7 million in funds um, that is being applied for in this grant for construction. Um, that would be added to a program that Caltrans has put together that some of you may have heard of or not heard of, but it's a combination of their shop program with capital um, that allows a combined project. So if they, if Caltrans had planned on spending shop money on overlays or, you know, operational type improvements, they could redirect that and add it to the program and that grant or that fund is at about 10 million. Um, if we're successful with this, that puts us into the $26 million category for construction. Added to that would be um, local funds um, that are available for construction. Um, some of the local funds are identified in the staff report. Uh, they include RIM, which is a roadway impact mitigation fee for future um, uh, impacts, impacts, future impacts of development. Um, and that is dealing with uh, some of the developments that were, that have been approved and are ongoing in the copper area. Um, so I would support this item. I have some um, suggested edits um, to the letter that I'll pass on to um, your interim executive director. Um, and other than that, the county would support this effort. Any questions? Yes. You speak of RIM fees. Um, is this project on the list? Yes, it is. Is 
And where is it at on the list? Do you know? Um, it was one of the top five projects on the REM fee list, mm -hmm. and it is um, within the Nexus study. It was assigned a percentage, mm -hmm. meaning that um, the Nexus study identified potential future impacts of the total development at build out um, for the subdivisions down in. Um, or the current tentative and final maps down in the copper area and it assigned a certain percentage. Um, and the percentage was um, assigned to the total cost of what was estimated, I don't know, when the RIM study was done, 10, 15 years ago? It's been a somewhere while ago, in, that's why I asked if this project. Yeah, so it was definitely on there. What we identified was uh, 1.5 million out of the current RIM fee program. Um, and again, the RIM fee program has always been identified as a funding of last resort. And the, um, the attempt is that um, we are identifying local monies as leverage, as it were, for this Federal Lands Access Program grant. Um, we think that it will be more successful with more local funds and non-federal funds. So. Um, um, Ms. Raju and I met with a committee member of the flat grant program last year to discuss where our application was in the last cycle and where it needs to be in the current cycle. And we are addressing um, those suggestions with some of these, um, these fund identifications for, for local match. Okay. And um, just for your information, uh, the next phase of this project moving into PSNE and right of way acquisition. Uh, county Public Works would lead the charge with consultants um, for the design portion, plan specs estimates, the construction document preparation. And I'm currently working with Caltrans on a, um, an agreement for Caltrans to uh, perform the right of way acquisition services. Um, um, I've discussed that with Mr. Jones and um, Ms. Raggio, not Raggio, but Eads, um, feeling that acquisition of right-of-way for a state highway on a new alignment is better done by Caltrans because it will be their right-of-way at the end of the day. Um, it's also something that they do on a daily basis. And so we feel like it will be a, a more efficient way and also um, adding oversight and management to county staff on this issue in addition to what we're currently carrying seemed a little bit unrealistic, so we felt that that was the best way to go. Okay. Any questions? Thank you for your update. Okay, thank and you. I would just like to add that the funding that Jeff was mentioning for right away, right away and design is on page nine in the CIP. Totals around $8 million. Thanks. This was an authorization, so I think we had a motion. Yes, yeah, I so moved, Chair. Uh, mm -hmm. Any further public comment? All for the vote. So moved. Is there any second? Second. Yeah, it was done. Okay. okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Three, seven, up. Item number 15, approving the fiscal year 2016-17 operation budget amendment number two. Uh, Mr. Raju. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this item, amendment number two, um, includes um, a previous amendment approved by the board or the council in February. Um, that was for staff training and working out a class that was approved in the amount of $11,000. Um, the addition to that is a um, accrual payout totaling $15,000 for a total increase to the operations budget in the amount of um, Twenty-six, seven fifty-six. Does council have any questions? This yes. approval is specifically for the fifteen thousand. Yes, yes. But you've already approved the eleven thousand. Right. Okay. Council comments. Uh, the, the question would be, uh, where are we going to offset the revenue? Where's the revenue coming from for this? Local transportation funds, LTF. Okay. Thank you. And that will be identified in the next item. The OWP amendment. Any further council comment? Any public comment? We have a, a motion to approve the fiscal year 1617 overall work program amendment. So moved. Two. 
Councilmember Nudris. Second. Second by Councilmember Camelano. Call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Approve 7 0. Item number 17. Approving the PTM ISEA. Um, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Item number 16. Uh, the overall work program. Um, Thank you. I'm number 16, approving, as was said, the overall work program amendment number two. Now that we've done the minute order for the operation budget, this is for the overall work program. Yes. Okay. So like I was saying in the previous item, staff is requesting uh, the council approve overall work program amendment number two, which will include the budget amendments into the overall work program. Um, three things um, have changed, the budget amendment, we're also asking to increase uh, contracts on work element number one to include the 13938 discussed previously um, for work performed outside of the scope and authorized by the executive director. Um, the other item is work element number 10 under grants. The um, mobility manager grant funding identified in that column has been removed. If the council has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Council, no questions. I hear a move. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Mills. Council comments. Public comment. Seeing none. Call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Approved. Agenda item 17, approving the revised public transportation modernization improvement and service enhancement program account, program expenditure plan, and allocation instructions totaling $312,830.56. Ms. Reggio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so staff is requesting the council approve um, a newly revised program expenditure plan submitted by the County Public Works Department and invoices um, submitted for reimbursement totaling three hundred and twelve eight hundred and thirty thousand. These were um, four invoices. They're attached um, behind the expenditure plan, um, and like I said, they total three hundred and twelve. This revenue is in receipt and in the fund and available for reimbursement on your approval. A question would be on agenda packet number page two thirty five. Uh, it's blurred to the point I can't read it. Okay. So, if you could email, just email that page to me as a oh, for sure. a clear copy. I would appreciate it. Okay. I would move number 17. Sure. Agenda number 17 is moved. No second. I got one question before we move it. Um, the when we're talking about the technician's hourly rate, are their hourly rate eighty-five dollars and seventy-seven cents, or is that for the shop? What what page are you on? Uh, packet page two forty-one or two forty. Director Krovitz. Shop rate. Excellent. Thank you. Do we have, a, we have a motion on the floor? Do we have a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Camelano. Any further council comment? Any public comment? Seeing none, call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Approved so. <coughs> Agenda item number 18, certifying the FTA section 5310 grant program regional application list. Ms. Collins. Good evening, Council. Uh, this item is certification of the Federal Transit Administration section 5310 grant program regional application list. Um, this year, there were three applications in our region and included in that table in the staff report. Um, one was Calaveras Transit and then Common Ground Senior Services who applied for two grants. And that, um, these requests represent three years of funding, so this cycle will be three years. So as the uh, Regional Transportation Planning Agency, the COG, um, is required to certify the projects included in our region for this program are in 
our um, coordinated public transit human services transportation plan. It's a mouthful, but we just called the coordinated plan. Um, and that they are eligible recipients. And I just want to uh, <coughs> clarify, clarify that these applicants are direct recipients of the funds and really COG's role is just the planning and programming of the funds. Um, and then after this, the uh, Caltrans will score and rank on a statewide basis. And I think probably in June is when um, the applicants will find out if they're awarded or not. Okay. Happy to answer any questions. So you're just basically working a certification process here? Yes. Thank you. So do we need to approve as a council this? Okay. So moved. Second. Second by Councilman Camelano. Any further council comment? Any public comment? Seeing none, call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Approve 7 up. Item number 19. I'm bearing my thought here. Approving a sub recipient agreement between the Calaveras Council of Governments and Calaveras County Planning Department for land use and traffic modeling. Ms. Collins. Thank you. Uh, this item is requesting approval of a sub recipient agreement between the COG and Calaveras County for land use and traffic modeling. Uh, this is funded through a Caltrans Transportation <coughs> Planning Grant that was awarded to the Amador County Transportation Commission as the main applicant and then the COG is a sub-applicant to that grant. Um, so this agreement will be fully funded and reimbursed through that grant. Um, this is really a standard agreement that we enter in with uh, county and city when we pass through uh, certain funds like this. And I'm just happy to be working with the planning department um, to see that this money goes towards uh, assisting them with local planning projects and efforts. Any questions? So moved. Moved. Council member. Communities? Second. Second. <coughs> council Member Camelano. Further council comment? Any public comment? Seeing none, call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Approve 7 off. Unmet Transit Needs Public Hearing, agenda item number 20. Ms. Collins. Thank you again. Uh, this is the Unmet Transit Needs Public Hearing, which is required each year by the Transportation Development Act um, to collect feedback on transportation services, which is Calaveras Transit, um, you know, services provided through the local transportation funds. Uh, all comments recorded through the public hearings that we do, and then um, we have a survey form that goes out. It's on buses, and we hand them out to social service agencies. So anything we collect throughout the year in terms of unmet transit needs um, gets collected and reviewed by the Social Services Transportation Advisory Council. And they're really made up of representatives of social service agencies um, that represent uh, individuals who are transit dependent. Um, then we, uh, the SISAC provides a recommendation to the council and we'll bring that report to you in August for your approval and that will go to Caltrans. And then I'll, Answer any questions or open to the council to open the public hearing. Okay. If there's no, there any council comments? Seeing none, I'm going to open up the public hearing. There you go. Public hearing for the unmet transit needs is open. Is there any public comment? Mr. Caldwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gary Caldwell, Valley Springs. Um, I was looking through the this uh, agenda packet, and I noticed that in some of the literature in there, that um, you get to ride the transit system at half price if you're over 65 or disabled and or disabled. And I was thinking that when I was at Amador, we our ridership was two thirds, what we call transportation disadvantaged, which included those two groups and uh, students. We gave them a 50% break. And I'm suggesting that you do the same or instruct the transit 
people to do the same offer that. Now, obviously you could say, well, wait a minute, we're already short on fare box return. If we get less money in, we'll be worse off. Well, hopefully the ridership will increase to offset that. And for that reason, I would suggest a, like a six month trial period to see how it goes, but not in the summertime, beginning September or something like that go six months and see what the ridership increase is because it will be there will be an increase and to see if that offsets any reductions that students would have paid otherwise and uh, give the kids a break and it would also hopefully help out the school districts in their transportation funding perhaps I don't know that but perhaps and uh, I just think it's a good idea when, when I say transportation disadvantage Usually kids under um, 16, first of all, they don't have a driver's license generally. They can't afford insurance. And um, they certainly can't rent a car. So they're stuck with either getting mom and dad or a buddy to drive them around or to ride public transit. And for that reason, I think they're sort of a captive audience with respect to public transit. So I, I think a, a break would be appropriate for them on a trial basis, like I said, see how it goes. And if it doesn't work out, you abandon it. Thank you. Any further public comment? Mr. Krovitz. Jeff Krovitz, Public Works County. I'm getting my exercise tonight. Shooting for my 10,000 steps. You can thank the COG for that. Thank you, Carl, <laughs> for that, and council members. Um, before I address the inmate transit needs, I want to address uh, Mr. Caldwell's comment. I thought it's a gr I think it's a very good idea. Um, however, um, with the system in the, syst the, the shape that it is in, um, and we're in our first year of risk for fare box recovery, um, my recommendation would be to work with COG staff to see if we have any excess LTF at all provide a grant program that would match the 50% reduction for student riders um, so that we're not hitting the fare box, but we are giving the student riders a break, a significant break. So it does two things. Um, it doesn't affect our fare box recovery, but it encourages additional riders. I don't know if there is any excess LTF at this point in time, but that would be my recommendation. Uh, I have significant concerns if we give this away. The majority of our student riders already are getting monthly passes, which is discounted fares. So um, just a suggestion. Um, uh, concerning the unmet transit needs, my only comment here would be to request the uh, board members and city council members that are on the council to reach out to their constituents and solicit comments uh, during the public hearing for unmet needs. Thank you very much. Any further public comments? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing. At this time, having closed the public comment, that closes the agenda item. Am I correct? Okay. Agenda item number 21, the county report. Krovitz, it's time for your exercise again. <laughs> okay, <laughs> County Report, Jeff Krovitz, Calaveras County Public Works. Um, first, I want to talk about disaster recovery, Butte Fire Recovery. Uh, the current program that's running in full steam is the hazard tree removal along county rights, county roads, county maintained roads approximately half of the burned trees are on the ground um, to date. Um, we are dropping between 800 and 1,200 trees per week, um, and that is operations of six days per week. Um, I forward the detailed reports to uh, supervisors uh, every Monday um, so that they know what the numbers are. Um, we're approximately 10% into the debris hauling. The debris hauling goes down to the Wallace Yard for um, counting and then processing into chip. Then the chips are hauled to uh, Ultra Power, the uh, Chinese camp just outside of Jamestown where uh, the biomass f 
uh, plant fires these burn tree debris into energy production. So that is the outcome for final treatment. Um, I just executed an amendment to my agreement with Alter Power where we tripled the value of the, um, the, the re repayment for these trees. Um, while you might think that's really good news, it's not necessarily good news for the disaster recovery program because that is a pass through. As soon as I receive a check from Alter Power, we have to forward those funds back to FEMA. Okay? But it is good news for our um, integrated waste management system because it means that our um, recovery uh, for the green waste that is eligible for biomass, um, we're tri tripling those revenues. So we will more than that. We will now more than cover our transportation costs. Um, in terms of the 2017 storm damage, uh, two forms in that. Um, it's all on county maintained roads. Some of them are eligible for federal aid. That program is administered by Federal Highway Administration through Caltrans. Um, we have completed our DAFs, which are damage assessment forms for emergency opening um, for the damage we've taken on to Jesus Maria. We did field reviews yesterday on Jesus Maria. Um, estimates for damage repair on Jesus Maria exceed $500,000 um, from the storms. Uh, the damage, um, we've also taken damage due to these storms on Mountain Ranch Road that are, um, that exceed, my, my rough estimate is uh, about 200,000. So those DAFs we are uh, now in the process of completing and submitting to Caltrans. The good news on that side of recovery is that FEMA has authorized permanent repairs under the same uh, programmatic constraints as emergency opening, which allows us to do the work um, more expeditiously. Okay. Uh, any questions on disaster recovery? So just for the record, what's our total storm damage number in the county? Um, it's between five and a half and six million right now, um, of which there is match required, um, and matches required are anywhere from 2.87% all the way up to 25%, depending on the program, the work, who's administering it, the grant, the subrecipient, all blah, blah, blah. Any other questions on that? And I, I, I want to say that um, I was um, lucky enough today to go on an airplane tour uh, with the sheriff, and we flew over that area. And it, was, it, it was, looked like it was working very well. I mean, the, the trucks were going in and out, and you know they were topping traffic and loading trucks and getting them on and getting them out. It looked like it was going very well from the air. The, the choreography on this is, um, I would say, complicated. And I think that our project manager, um, Tetra Tech, and our contractor, P&J, Phillips and Jordan, um, are doing very well. Um, Tetra Tech benefits because they were a subconsultant to um, Sukit for the debris removal and the butte fire of ash. And Phillips and Jordan was a contractor, subcontractor to PG&E for uh, felling and hauling of trees along the utility rights of way um, in order for PG&E and AT&T to replace their poles and their overhead. So um, that's good. And um, I fully expect that all the trees that are currently in the program to be on the ground by the beginning of May. Um, there will probably be a two to three month delay in terms of the debris being hauled um, and then treated. Um, and then we have an extra three to four months of expected duration for insurance recovery, um, where FEMA has required the county to reach out and seek insurance repayment um, from those uh, property owners on private property debris removal that have insurance to cover debris removal following a disaster. Well, it certainly looked like they had the routine down now. They've been doing it for a while, and things were going to look to be, from from my vantage point and view, it looked to be well organized and being done well. So. Thank you. And um, for an approximate $16 million program, um, the number of complaints that a, the Public Works Department are receiving are surprisingly low. Okay, now, I'm not saying that we don't have issues, but we're dealing with them. Um, 
I fully expect that there's going to be another thousand trees added to this program before we're done. Okay. Any other questions on disaster recovery? Um, I did not speak to tree mortality. That's not yet in my purview. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the CIPs that we currently have going, so you're aware of them. The phase four bus shelters. Jeff, one other question on your disaster recovery. Okay. Blagan Road. Oh, <laughs> Blagan Road. <laughs> it's one of my favorite subjects. I'm sure it is. Um, I have put together a request for authorization um, from Cal OES uh, for funding for installation of a temporary bridge and approach roadways for the Blagan Road crossing. Um, I made the first request um, on March 10th and it took them several, about a week or so to get back to me and say, you're missing some paperwork. So I put the paperwork in front of the board on the 28th of March, they accepted it. Uh, two days later, I provided that paperwork to Cal OES, um, re-asked again and resubmitted my application. Um, they informed me that I'm missing a little more paperwork. Um, that was submitted last night, and I will ask again tomorrow. Um, but um, as soon as I get permission, I believe that I can have uh, that crossing re-established with a temporary bridge within 30 to 35 days. Unfortunately, we are currently What's the date today? The April 5th. The 5th. Um, uh, Little League season at White Pines Park starts May 1st. So I've already missed that day. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have been working with CCWD. Uh, they are the primary landowner um, on the east side of that crossing. Um, and I keep them aware every couple of days as I do a representative from the community. So um, I don't know if you are aware or not, but the Board of Supervisors um, uh, made a finding by resolution as part of the local state of emergency that this crossing was of critical infrastructure as well as critical to the welfare of the community, um, therefore helping to support my case that this should be funded um, under the uh, recovery program. Uh, the local match, if approved, would be six and a quarter percent. My estimated cost for the temporary bridge um, as a purchase, um, including the approach roadways, is in the neighborhood of 150000 Okay, I expect that if it's approved, that temporary bridge would be in place for 30 to 36 months while we go through a fairly complicated process for um, engineering analysis to be able to determine the proper structure um, to replace the failed culvert um, with um, and go through the environmental clearance that would meet NEPA and CEQA requirements because we have both federal and state funding. Thank you. Any further questions on Blagan? Good enough. I'll move on to the CIPs. Um, the phase four bus shelters, that's where I got lost. Um, uh, the Valley Springs Dollar General, we've completed our topo, the base mapping is complete, and we are working on design. The Murphy's Playhouse uh, topo is complete, the base map is almost complete. Uh, the Capello Stop in Angel's Camp topo is complete, the base map is almost complete. Uh, so the difference between topo and base map, uh, topo is your topographic information, your surfaces, your base map is your adding all your, your, your improvements and your preliminary engineering. Okay, uh, Bret Hart High School, Topo is complete with the exception of the right of way. We should be tied in within the next week or so. So we're just trying to confirm some right of way so we can get the right of way lines on there accurately. It's important because we will in all likelihood be do performing work both on Caltrans right of way and the high school right of way. Um, I, we're gonna need a little retaining wall, all right. Uh, the Moak Hill um, stop, the topo is complete, the base map is nearly complete, the courthouse, there is no topo required, the base map is nearly complete. Looking ahead, we're expecting 60% PSNE at all locations, ready for review the middle of May. Um, and that's it for the phase four PTMS IEA bus stop improvement project. Questions? Okay. We also have a project 
um, that was in the planning stages, actually completed preliminary planning stages, for a sidewalk infill along uh, St. Charles Street near High School Street and around the corner. Um, rather than move that project into the next phase, which should be construction documents, um, uh, with uh, support from Supervisor Tofanelli, we decided to take those funds and move them into the Mountain Ranch Road project, which was underfunded. So I would rather have one project funded completely than two projects not funded. Um, and at this point in time, I think the Mountain Ranch Road sidewalk project is a higher priority project for a number of reasons that I'll get into in a minute. But the infill project at High School Street, there is um, a lot of external parts that are continuing to move. We are uh, most of the way through our San Andreas corridor and internal circulation study. Um, and that study has identified the need for one or two crosswalks crossing State Route 49 near this location. And um, Supervisor Tofanelli and I have reviewed a request that I will send to Caltrans for a safety and speed survey at that location so we have more information. Um, don't want to pull the trigger on that project quite yet. Another um, moving part is that Caltrans has a future project to remove the crown along State Route 49 through San Andreas. Um, that's a pretty big project, and in advance of that project, I've advanced Rule 20A funds um, through PG&E to underground the utilities on the north side of that corridor um, from Main Street um, up to Pool, I believe, Pool Station at this point in time. So if we can get those things undergrounded, that would give us more room for sidewalks, um, and I think we'll have a better final product. Any questions on that? Thank you for explaining that. Okay. A uh, Mountain Ranch Road sidewalk project, it includes sidewalks um, on both sides of Mountain Ranch Road, um, extending from Government Center to uh, 49 St. Charles, um, and also improvements at the Pope Street intersection. Um, there were not enough funds, which is why I essentially requested movement of funds from the, uh, the High School Street project to this project. In addition to that, um, I have requested inclusion of a crosswalk between Government Center and the hospital, um, and that was not funded, so I need additional money for design, um, environmental, and then construction on that, and uh, the movement of this money makes that whole. Um, this project is being funded by a number of combined funds and combined projects. I have rural 20A money for PG&E undergrounding. I have CMAC funding, air quality. I've got local funds on that, including some RIM. I also have mitigation funds from the Courthouse Jail Sheriff's Office construction project. So it is a combination of projects to bring us a single project of importance to, the, uh, to this area. Jeff, okay. will, will, that, will that crosswalk be a lighted crosswalk? It's going to be a pedestrian activated signal. Yeah. So what that means is that when a pedestrian comes up to the crosswalk, whether they uh, have vision or they're blind or deaf or whatever, it would be activated by passing through a light beam. The light beam would then trigger uh, flashing lights in advance because we're on a curve um, to warn motorists that there's a crosswalk ahead and it's about to turn red. And then the, the crosswalk would turn red, we'd get some beeping, people could cross, and when they're clear of the crosswalk, it goes to green. So um, it gives prioritization to the vehicular travel traffic on Mountain Ranch Road, but it still allows um, the signal to be activated when a pedestrian wants to cross. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense because my ADT on Mountain Ranch Road at that location exceeds 7,000 car vehicles a day. Okay, pretty heavily traveled for a two-lane road. Any other questions on that project? Okay. Um, um, the Mountain Ranch Road project to finalize, um, we are moving into phase two um, uh, studies for cultural resources clearance. Uh, we have to do a lot of boring in the locations of where the improvements are going to occur to see if we are gonna run into cultural resources, which we suspect we will. Um, that was a place where our Miwoks wanted to live, being close to the creek with a lot of water, fairly flat, nice shade, a lot of oak trees, so we expect to see a lot of um, resources that we don't want to, that we want to protect. 
So we're moving into that. It also requires an agreement with PG&E for the expenditure of the transfer of the Rule 28 funds for um, a portion of the project for the underground and the utilities. Um, it will also include undergrounding of some utilities for county communication systems as well. Okay, questions on that? Moving on. A Burns Ferry Road left-hand turn pocket. We're currently working on an agreement with PG&E for the relocation of the overhead. That will clear the right-of-way to allow us to widen the road and put in a left-hand turn pocket. However, to date, we have no dollars identified for that road work. Um, it may be a good project for um, the Highway Safety Improvement Program. I think that it would be a good discussion to have with COG to see if we want to uh, uh, advance an HSIP grant application for that. Um, in the next call for projects. Wagon Trail, I've already briefed you on Wagon Trail. The only thing I didn't brief you on was projected schedule. Um, uh, COG anticipates having this in front of the CTC um, for the authorization for expenditures for the PSE and right of way portions in July. Um, I want to follow that immediately with my request for proposals for PSE and uh, design support during construction services. And I think that will fit nicely with my. Um, contract uh, or an agreement with um, Caltrans for right-of-way acquisition. We assume that PSNE and right-of-way acquisition will take one and a half to two years. If we're successful with the flat, flat grant, we could move, be moving into construction by 2020. Um, if we are successful with the flat grant um, and we have the Caltrans funding, uh, we can uh, construct approximately from Appaloosa down the hill past pool station. Um, so that's what we consider to be the most critical portion or the most unsafe portion of that state highway. It will not complete the project. Um, estimates for the complete project, which is over seven miles, is in excess of 70 million. Any questions on Wagon Trail? I'll ask that uh, Wagon Trail moves along, just keep me posted, because I know CSD2 is very curious to where they'll fit into this as that starts to happen. Okay. Specifically at Appaloosa, the intersection of Appaloosa and Four. Yeah, well, that one is included right. right now. And worst case scenario, we get no funding from FLAP, and we only have our funding and Caltrans funding. We'll do a smaller portion. We will include the Appaloosa intersection. Yeah, as it moves forward, though, CSD2 has been asking me about it. So I yeah, I've got similar concerns at Stallion. I do, too. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, public Works staff has been working heavily on the 1718 budget. Um, they are due on Friday. The drafts are due on Friday. Uh, the transit is uh, pretty neutral from 1617. Um, although we do anticipate a decrease in our LTF share um, coming to the transit system. Um, that's going to have to be made up in reduction of services unless there's other places where we can find savings. Um, the roads and bridges fund um, is getting actually no LTF, and therefore I'm going to be taking a recommenda recommending some fairly severe reductions in our line item expenditure for materials. Uh, last year it was about 750,000. I'm expecting it to be about 350,000 this year, which is about a 46% decrease. Um, it was offset. It will be offset a little bit by the um, the franchise fee. Uh, funding that we got from the uh, curbside uh, agreement for solid waste collection, voluntary, throughout the county. Um, but 75000 after a uh, $300,000 reduction is not much. Um, I think the only thing that's going to keep us rolling until hopefully uh, state and federal funding uh, issues get resolved is that we are going to be working actively on disaster recovery. Um, that will be partially funded. That will keep us going. But at this point in time, um, it looks fairly dire for Roads and Bridges, which is our operation and maintenance um, branch of our county maintained road system. Any questions on that? It's all the news that I have. Oh, uh, uh, Ms. Collins didn't mention, but we are moving right along with the, um, the San Andreas Gateway and Corridor Study Project. Um, I expect this council to see a draft report in the near future, as um, you will also see a draft report in the near future on the RTP. Any questions on that? If uh, city council or, um, or board of supervisors have any um, 
projects that you're hearing about from your constituents, please contact Ms. Collins or myself. We can get those into the, into the RTP. If they're not in the RTP, we can't, see, can't get grant funding to build it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Director Krovitz. I just wanted to share with you this morning at Epoch, your staff and your department received quite a bit of praise over their efforts over the potholes up the hill. Okay, thank you. Hopefully we'll have enough uh, material next year to be able to continue to fill them. <laughs> Mr. Krovitz, are you, are you going to be around for the end of the meeting? Yes. Just a minute after. Sure. And item number 22, the transit report. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Krovitz. <laughs> Jeff Krovitz, Calaveras County Public Works. <laughs> I'm wearing out. Um, okay, so I uh, wanted to make a quick correction to the agenda for this item. Uh, uh, this is, item is not the final transit report. This is the mid-year. And it, the agenda, unfortunately, identifies it as, a, as the end of the year transit report, both in the staff report and in the agenda. So I didn't want anybody to think that this is the, the, um, the end of the year transit report. Um, I'm going to hit the highlights, and then I'm going to take questions. I'm presenting this uh, for our transit manager, uh, Deborah Mullen. She's not feeling very well tonight, um, but if you guys have um, you know, technical or specific questions, she's more than willing to be here to answer them. So I'll hit the highlights. Um, you've already heard the highlight about the hit to the fare box recovery. Um, that, is the, um, that is the holy grail of transit. Um, the federal government expects us to be able to obtain a 10% fare box recovery over our expenditures. So we're running just over a million dollar system. Um, they're expecting us to generate $100,000 in fare box recovery. That would also include advertising revenues. Um, and we're not quite there yet. Uh, we just don't have the ridership. However, uh, we have gone through a process of a short range transit plan. Um, the short range transit plan had several recommendations, several options. The county recommended a county efficiency model um, option, brought that to both the council and the board of supervisors. Board of supervisors voted to go for that option. And we started with a revised service plan this week. So unfortunately, this mid-year report um, reflects old operations. So operations that occurred from July 1st to six months after that. Um, and we will not see a change um, in overall performance until um, based on these recommendations of the short range transit plan and the added routes that we've added. Um, we are focusing on providing additional service along the spine of the routes. And we think getting people from Valley Springs to San Andreas to Angels Camp and up to Arnold area are critical. That's the backbone of our system. Uh, also as well down towards copper and four. So we're focusing a lot on our state highway corridors. Um, and the corridor that has continuously had the, the, the greatest expense and the least amount of riders, of course, is the 26 east of 49. Um, we have a, a smaller population. They don't seem to want to ride transit or it's not convenient for them. So we are changing that service to be more of a um, more options, less days, with options for dial, dial a ride. And we hope that we will get um, better recovery and more participants on the system um, with that. Uh, the system is flexible in terms of being able to run buses that would accommodate the anticipated number of riders. So we're hoping to be leaner, meaner, more efficient and get back to our 10% fare box recovery so we don't get punished two years from now. Uh, some other things that I want to highlight is that the operating cost per vehicle hour at $90.80, that's down. So that's a nice trend. That reflects both the added experience of our uh, mechanics and our shop, as well as um, the improvement from not running very old buses that suffered from poor maintenance um, when they were first put into service. Um, the, uh, the fare box recovery includes 
the low performance of the Delta Gold Line. And as you recall, the Delta Gold Line is the line that was an intimate transit need to provide service to Stockton. So we're not getting riders on that. $161 per ride. Per ride, $163 per rider it cost us, mm -hmm. and we're subsidizing $161. So we're recovering $2 does not and and the good news about that is that doesn't have to be part of the fare box at this point because it's uh, you have a period a grace period to essentially build ridership on new routes before you start having to account for your fare box recovery on those routes so while it's low and very poor <clears throat> right now it's not hurting us um, but it may come, if we cannot improve ridership on that, it may very well come that we're going to have to eliminate that run. Simple. Do um, you think it's the, the, the times that, that the service is provided? Um, you know, I mean, hard to know. And Deborah may want to speak to this. She may not feel up to it. But um, it does us no good to ask the riders that are actually buying tickets. Um, we need to somehow find the riders that may want to ride, and we're not sure where we're going to find them. Um, the, the, the real disadvantaged community that needs to get to Stockton or get to Sacramento, for example, the veterans who are seeking medical, um, they get subsidized for their rides. And if it's not convenient to their appointments, maybe they're not going to ride it. Well, and if I'm not mistaken, because I've been behind that bus traveling to Stockton, and, and mm -hmm. either both ways, it goes through Linden, so it goes down 26. Previously, we would go through 12, would we not? And we had commuters at 12 that parked at the old fire station there on Burson Road and 12 and rode that, and then he picked up riders in Wallace. And perhaps that line was going to Lodi first and then going to Stockton. That was an inner city service that just went to Lodi, um, and that was canceled because of low ridership. Low ridership yeah. What we're hoping is going to happen uh, with the Delta Gold Line is that we've improved the, the connections to our other routes. So now, just beginning this week, riders from Arnold can travel uh, Calaveras Transit to San Andreas and catch the Delta Gold Line. So I think we'll have more potential passengers um, that will use it to get to uh, regional transportation, Amtrak, Greyhound, um, Delta College into medical facilities. If it doesn't, uh, we won't keep running it. Does that, does that route stop in Valley Springs? Yes, it stops. If, so one it, of the stops are there to go. It stops at La Contenta Plaza, the, um, the shelter there, and then it has a stop in Linden. That's Deborah Mullen, our transit manager. Um, let's see. Uh, you've heard about the LTF claim that was certified by the county auditor and being reviewed by COG staff. Um, we're looking forward to receiving that. Uh, the service changes that began this week, the main line goes all the way from Valley Springs to Columbia College. We've increased the frequency on the main line to nine times daily between Valley Springs and Angels Camp, six times daily to Columbia College. We have better connections with the feeder routes. Um, the non-main routes, the low-performing routes now only with advanced requests. Uh, West Point to San Andreas only Mondays and Wednesdays, but late bus from San Andreas to um, West Point every day. And we've also increased our nighttime bus runs to try to accommodate the high school students that are doing after-school programs. Cool. So we think that's going to help. Um, and hopefully we can expand that program. Questions? Uh, Jeff, I, I understand copper is kind of a challenge for us in terms of fare box recovery as well. Is that an area that we might want to look at either uh, going that to an on-demand service rather than as we have it now? You know, um, it's hard to know about the demographics, but one of the things that we noticed is that um, in the first, you know, I don't know, eight or ten years of that route, we had a lot of kids. Um, it seems that they've grown up and moved. Okay. Um, I'm hoping that in the next iteration we might have senior citizens who may be more interested in riding the bus um, to get to where they're going. But that remains to be seen. 
remember that this entire service for transit, for County Transit, um, is an on-demand service. So we have the ability to go off route up to a mile, mile and a half. We also have the ability to stop anytime somebody flags us down. So it attempts to be the best of both worlds. Um, how it's going to grow into the future, we'll keep on changing, we'll keep on running, we'll keep on attempting to reduce our costs. Um, uh, we'll also attempt to continue to reach out to uh, the disadvantaged community that is truly targeted for our service. The people that can't afford the vehicles, uh, the disabled, the senior, the student communities. So, anyway, um, last thing I wanted to mention is that we're working on the fare shuttle. Um, we're working on a schedule for the fare shuttle, and uh, we'll be circulating a fare booth volunteers request. Public Works Department this year has rented three spaces that are side by side by side to include transit, integrated waste management, and public works. And so we are seeking volunteers who would love to work our booth and help talk up transit. Jeff did a great job. I just want to um, add one thing, or maybe a couple things, um, is that the, the deviation isn't a mile and a half, but we can go three quarters of a mile um, out, off the route for, um, on, for by request, and we'll give priority to uh, seniors and, and persons with disabilities. And um, we can, but I want to um, stress that the bus will stop any place along the route that's safe and that um, the customer service office is more than happy to work with people to talk about where they'll be and to make the service uh, work for them because there's long distance between the time points on the schedule. Um, but that doesn't mean that the bus, and the bus does stop, people are knowing you know, increasingly they're knowing that the bus will stop for them. Um, but it's a really good idea to give a call first so that the radio dispatcher can alert the driver, look for the, look for the man standing over there by that tree. Um, so- I have a question. Yes, Amanda. Um, so will that, uh, what you're talking about going to extra mile, is that um, what's contributing to the extra miles in the mid-year? <sighs> like, providing that service? Is that why the mileage went up? No, no, that we've always had that deviation okay. um, ability and that's a, pretty much a requirement that we do that and we will as much as possible. <coughs> but no, we've increased the frequency of the main route, the, what's called the red line now between Rally Springs and Columbia College. Um, and um, to Mr. Caldwell's point about uh, attracting students We've really improved the connection at Bret Hart High School. Um, after school, there's the bus that goes to Copper, um, and it will go to um, the neighborhoods off of Copper Cove Drive and down Little John Road, and, and just has the ability to um, go more places and to pick up in those places too with advance call. So as we, um, you know, this is the third day of the new system. Um, we're learning every day a little little bits about how we can make it better. So we look um, at the possibility of making some adjustments a few months down the road. But um, it, it's looking like it's going to work well for the community. Would you guys expect to have better data? Are you looking at the next four months, six months to, to tell you? Um, it, it'll be maybe just a, a few months that we'll be able to get a, a concept, but the data will be longer in coming to, to make sense. I don't know how long, maybe uh, six months or so. Um, the only reason I asked is because you, earlier you mentioned about looking into the future next year with um, the LTS funds, and so um, it would be nice to have some of that data when we start looking yes. forward to some of that planning of the money. So I just wanted to see if it was going parallel with each other. Um, Let me take this. Um, thank you for the question, really nice question. Um, we'll have some data that may be able to interpret trends um, at the year end. Um, so the year end will take care of the second six months of which four will be on the new route, two will be on the old route. 
Um, so we may begin to see some trends there. And um, um, I think that would be a good point in time to evaluate and look for some tweaks. Um, but big decisions, I think that we really need to know what's going to happen in the summer months when we don't have students, okay? And how that's going to affect, uh, affect these routes. And how can like the Saturday hopper, for example, help balance that out with the revenue that you're making there? I mean, can that help balance that missing? Because there's so much going on during the summer with the concerts and whatnot that students that help boost the loss. We really hope so, um, but we are we're working with with Ironstone now to talk about. Uh, potential of uh, additional transit stops and um, additional buses during events in Murphy's or at Ironstone. Okay. Um, one capital project that I didn't mention, if I can, is a project that was an earmark, a congressional earmark the county received eight or ten years ago. Is that about right? Okay, about eight years ago. It, it was called the ceiling of unpaved roads. Um, uh, the director at the time identified uh, Hogan Road, um, which is a gravel road, to be sealed. And sealing can be anything from a sodium chloride application to gravel to keep the dust down anywhere to a chip seal to a pavement. Um, uh, that project didn't really get much attention. And when I got here, uh, my deputy director, Robert Packinger, suggested that we re repurpose those funds and apply them to Six Mile Road. Um, as it being a higher need. It's parallel capacity to Highway 4. It gives us, um, uh, we have a lot of concert goers that are directed there by both Google Map and um, Yahoo Maps that, because it's a shorter route, it's not the better route. Um, and if you're the second car in line going to a concert in the middle of the night, you are out of luck if you're expecting to have sight distance at all. It's disastrous. And um, that has to do with the material that was laid down, the gravel material that was laid down. It tends to, uh, to turn to powder under the wheel loads. Additionally, the Vallecito camp that's operated by Cal Fire is there. And they are one of our primary responders to uh, wildland fires within the state responsibility area, as well as in federal lands for Tuolumne and Calaveras counties. So it was really important to us to be able to provide them with a, a quicker egress to their site. Um, I don't know if there's enough funds in this program to be able to pave all the way from Vallecito Camp to where the pavement ends on Six Mile Road, but what we will do is we will pave as much as we can, and that that we can't afford to pave with hot mix asphalt we will, might go to a chip seal or, or, or a treated asphalt base, a lime treated base or something like that to keep the dust down. But um, uh, we're awaiting um, definitions and uh, permission to go ahead and apply for our design funds. Uh, with Caltrans, and I'm expecting that this month. So that's another good capital. It's a great capital project. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Any other questions? It looks like we're going to be missing that 10% goal this year. <laughs> yes. I think I don't think there's any way that we can. I don't either. So we need to probably really seriously look at next year to be sure we don't miss it next year, considering the risk factors involved. Uh, well, the risk factor is really year three. Year um, three. Well, and. You know, when I heard the auditor indicate that if we maintained our um, our fare box recovery where it is now, the hit to the system is going to be eighteen thousand dollars. That doesn't bother me too much. It's the other part. It's the other part. I agree. Okay. okay. Any other questions from the council? Thank you so much for um, your support and help, and good luck with the uh, search for the new ED. Agenda item 23. Mr. Hanham, you've been very quiet back there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, fellow council members, I'm Dave Hanham, city planner for the City of Angels. Just going to touch on a few of our projects. Uh, we're working with uh, Caltrans right now to get a kickoff meeting uh, with our project development team for our uh, Highway 4 PSR. 
and PID pay document. Uh, we've been working with them and with there also is a great possibility that we're going to be able to get some shop shop money for some operational improvements on 49 and 4 as in connection with our partnership planning grant that we did with them about a year about a year now a year ago. So we're working on that. Um, we just had for our Angels what we call our Angels Creek project, which is our our trail projects and our two major sidewalk projects. We we've had conducted stakeholder meetings with some property owners along the trail and and the sidewalks and. We've got good feedback from them, uh, from the from the residents, and we look forward to move, moving forward with that. Um, in terms of our uh, our sustainability grant, uh, we just got an admin draft, I think, right now. We're reviewing that, we're in the process of reviewing that, um, and hopefully get that, at least a draft, to, the, to all of our boards here in the next probably two or three months. Um, so we're reviewing those. Um, in terms of, you know, with all the with all the talk of transit and what we've been doing, the city's going to be taking a look at transit, what how we find what our funds do, and kind of see what where we need to go, as well. So we're going to be, we're going to be doing that internally, um, and uh, hopefully we'll get some get some good things going. Um, we're also working on just kind of give you a, just a brief what's going on with the city. Uh, our Dollar General it um, uh, it's in its final phases of uh, doing getting its improvements. It's, the building's been approved. Uh, all we're waiting for is a lot line adjustment and some offsites for Caltrans to do. But, uh, and then they'll be able to start construction. So we're looking forward to that. Um, we've been in contact with uh, Mark Twain Medical Center for, uh, of course, we've been working with them for the last 10 years, it seems like, eight years. But they are going to be submitting a new package for their project on Stanislaus Avenue. Um, which hopefully they want to, which they want a pretty fast uh, turnaround time, which we think we can do just because the site's been reviewed, I don't know, four or five, six times already. Uh, and so we hope to hopefully get them moving along. Uh, we are, uh, uh, let's see what else, uh, sustainable communities. Uh, we're moving forward with our, with our, our, our one big subdivision, which are, creates our big traffic in the city. We're probably about almost halfway through. In terms of homes and permits have been pulled, uh, we're, we're sitting on about 13 more that the developer hopes to be pulling here in the next probably s right before the end of the fiscal year. So that'll be a good a good thing. So we'll have almost half of that project uh, at least pulled for permits, and they've sold approximately I think eight or nine out of the 55. So so they're moving forward. Uh, let's see. Other than that, I think that's. That's all I have. So unless there are any questions on anything, I'm happy to. Dave, just so for clarity for us, when mm -hmm. you talk about major project, I mean, we're familiar between our Creek Angel Oaks and the one over on um, Dogtown Road. Oh, Dogtown Road, yeah. Which one are you talking about? It's obviously not Greenhorn Creek, and I don't think it's Angel Oaks. Are you talking about Dogtown Road? Uh, are you talking about our sidewalk projects? Or you just talked about a build out of development. 55. Oh, there's a Greenhorn Creek. It's oh, it is Greenhorn. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's a new phase in Greenhorn then. Yeah, it's, it's the final. It's It, it was kind of like a, uh, a runaway phase. It got adopted back in 2006, the subdivision. Okay. Uh, I have to turn into the golf course. Yeah, it's right there. You, as you go into the golf course, they're, they're being built right there. <laughs> yeah, it's from Denova. Yeah, from Denova home. So, yeah. So, move forward on. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions for our city? Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Caltrans. Welcome, Mr. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I passed out a, uh, a little information sheet. Uh, District 10 is looking to put together an active transportation plan for the district. Most of the jurisdictions within the district have some sort of bicycle pet pedestrian plans. Um, the idea behind uh, a plan for the district is really to look at gaps, look at how, uh, where there's needs uh, between those existing plans, and uh, essentially where and, and looking at how we develop our projects, we're trying to make sure that we address complete streets. Uh, that should help us identify those additional needs uh, when we have opportunities to combine those in a project. Um, so essentially that's just letting you know what, what we're thinking of doing. That plan, uh, we would be applying for 
some uh, what we call SBR money uh, inside the department. That pot of money is um, funds part of the grant program that you're familiar with that, that's funding the, uh, the Main Streets grant and Angels Camp and the San Andreas grant. There's a part of that that's also reserved internally for Caltrans and the district can compete for those. Um, another item that's come and gone now is uh, we had an issue with what we call NEPA assignment from FHWA, uh, that's Federal, House, or Federal Highways. Um, when we do projects with federal funding, uh, there has to be an analysis under the National Environmental Policy Act, that's NEPA, is very similar to CEQA that you're familiar for state projects. Um, gosh, I don't know when it actually started. It's about 2006 or seven, I believe. We were uh, given delegation by the federal government to act as the lead agency for the NEPA projects, most of the NEPA projects that we do. So essentially what that means is uh, if Jeff brings us a, a bridge project that uh, is being funded with federal bridge money, uh, the system used to be that um, we would coordinate the project, but we would have to send the NEPA to the federal highways to have them actually review and approve it. It was an extra step. Under NEPA delegation or NEPA assignment, we simply do that. Uh, Caltrans, federal has said Caltrans can do this for these classes of projects. That, w had, that was an, originally a pilot program. It was set to sunset. Um, it did sunset. We went th three months of um, uncertainty with it where it actually had expired. We were operating under um, other authorities that we had. Um, so some of the big projects had some, some potential for being delayed. We did get that done. It's been approved by the, the federal government and uh, we're good to go again. The big issue with that is that in making that change uh, a decade ago, essentially Federal Highways uh, removed the staff in California that did those kinds of reviews. So having that lapse and uh, go away would have been uh, pretty difficult to, to work with. Uh, so all of that's a, a, good, um, a good result for, for all of us in the state. I wanted to make a small correction. Jeff said we have a project for fixing the crown on 49. Uh, we don't, we're not actually developing a project. Uh, the idea has been since we're working on that cooperative partnership project in San Andreas, we know we're going to need a project. Um, we want to try to coordinate that with the, the needs for sidewalks and whatever else needs to be done as, as well as possible. Um, and, and certainly we, we need to follow up and make sure that that project comes to be, but it doesn't actually exist yet. Um, the, the other big thing, and, and you're seeing it on, on the news, and I, I don't think I need to say that much about it, but there's a lot of action going on now with the legislature on the funding package, and um, y there's enough in the news that I don't think I have anything relevant to add. Uh, at this point, it's, it's um, not fake news. Hmm? It's not <laughs> fake news. Ask <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> hard questions. Um, we've been through this in previous years, but I don't think we've made it to the point where we've we've gotten to this much push. So, um, you know, the hopes are that that'll come to pass. Um, we're trying to identify. Uh, what we could possibly do with that money. That doesn't mean that we're going to get it, but uh, we try to be ready so that if it happens, we're, we're ready to move forward and get some things done. Um, following up on some of the uh, issues that have come up, for the Burson Beacons, there was a kickoff meeting with the contractor. Um, I wasn't able to attend it, but <laughs> it's a good sign. It means they're they're getting ready to go out there and do it. So uh, I, I received an email on that. It says the construction will start April 26th. 
Well, that's also good that you're getting the emails. Yes. <laughs> it is good. They, so you have their attention. It, it, it will start April 26th and be completed May 10th. So yeah, it shouldn't take it, very long. Yeah, I mean, holes and yeah. maybe some. I think they I might have to bore under the road. I don't, yeah. I'm not sure, but yeah. Um, the other items um, in looking at the uh, birth and speed change, we agreed that uh, we need a letter on that. And um, I wanted to clarify, Jeff mentioned um, speed survey and safety investigation for High School Road. I think the original request was for um, uh, signal warrants. So um, be clear what you're, what you're asking for and, and uh, we'll get that to the people that need to get to work on it. I, yeah, I will meet with Jeff and get that. Okay. Yeah. That sounds good. Signal because it's 30 miles an hour now. It's still too fast for a kid to get out of there. Yeah. Um, I think that's it, unless there's questions. Gary, would you like to? I heard you say. Uh, In, in San Andreas, we, we did an overlay project from Angel's Camp on 49, all from Angel's Camp to Mokelney Hill. And there was a section in San Andreas that we had to remove from the project because the existing crown of the road um, exceeds the spec. We can't add more asphalt on top. We, we're out of spec. Uh, so what that means is that to, to you know, it's already been identified as a pavement need. Um, so, you know where those limits are? It's, it's pretty one much, of the north one end of the it's south pretty end of much town. right by the cog to down, not quite to the pickle patch. If you look on Google, you can see it because the pavement changes color. Um, pretty easy. So, but it's really most most of San Andreas. Yeah. Yeah, it so needs to be ground down and ground and then. Yeah. There's an underlying issue. So, um, it's on, you know, it's good that Jeff is looking at the utilities. When and will that be done? When <laughs> we, it's not a project yet. So, what, we're, what we've been working with um, the county on a planning project for the San Andreas Corridor on 49. So we're trying to make sure that we've identified that as an opportunity in that in that planning study to coordinate any work that the county wants to do concerning the the sidewalks and curbs and whatever other needs there are. So does that mean it's off at least three years? Or oh yeah, yeah. But um, <laughs> something that we that we have, you know. Uh, that we have a project planned for usually is, is likely th three years out. So, but it's, it's a need and, and we're aware of it. And uh, certainly it's something that we, um, as that planning study comes to a conclusion, <coughs> there's gonna need to be follow up to make sure that um, we get that through that, that not only is this a need that Caltrans is aware of, but also that the county has made some plans to try to work with it, with Caltrans to, uh, you know, look at the bigger picture for the corridor. Well, construction starting on um, Vista Del Lago and Highway 26, um, signalization. Did you ask for a date and I didn't get yeah, it for I'm you? Yeah, I'm asking for a date. <laughs> um, okay. I've heard several different things. Perhaps okay. you can find out a, a construction date and forward that to me. Yeah. Yeah, but there's not a construction date. It says that it's just a month that it's going to start sometime in May or something. I want a specific date, like I got for the signalize uh, for the uh, flashing beacon on Burson Road. If we can at least come up with some date, projected time when they're going to start and and stop when it'll be finished. Okay. Construction time. A lot of I, I'll follow up with the with the um, the resident engineer 
is usually the best information on that. What happens with that is most of that information comes from our uh, public information office and the, um, it's keyed towards the traffic control because that's what people, you know, what impacts people. And um, so I can push a little harder and, and see if they have a, an actual start work date. Yeah, that would be nice if we can, as we get closer to that, at least we have some specific dates. Okay. If you give them to me as soon as possible, I appreciate it. Thank you. Great, thank you. I got a question. This handout that we received on uh, state planning and research grant, mm -hmm. District 10 active transportation plan, uh, it says that uh, special study submissions are due to headquarters by April 14th. Is this a pro uh, program that's going to be utilized on a yearly basis? Because it looks like it's this could potentially work for this crown. No, uh, th th this is planning only money. Okay. So, so um, and it's, it's for, you know, internal to the districts at Caltrans. So essentially they're they're um, telling us when we need to send our proposal in to headquarters. Um, so it wouldn't really apply to that. I mean, more or less the, the crown issue is, is, you know, more or less engineering. There isn't a whole lot of planning behind it. The pavement needs to be replaced. The engineers need to decide, you know, are they just going to grind it down? Uh, do they need to do more than that? And um, I assume when they do that, they probably drill some holes and figure out what's underneath the road and, and uh, go from there. But uh, it, it shouldn't require much planning. Is there a specific um, thing you, you need to turn in? I mean, you, it, it says special study submissions are due. So what does that entail, special study submissions? Is there a, a, something you go on the website and fill out? No. for for. I, it's, I could see where it's confusing. Um, that information was for the district to be aware of when we needed it. And essentially, we went to agencies and asked for letters of support. So I'm giving you something that that's, was uh, intended. I, I just want you to be aware that we, we're trying to do this thing. And part of the purpose of that was also to provide to agencies to say, could you write us a letter of support? Because I already have a project to submit <laughs> along Highway 26 from Vista Del Lago to Highway 12 for a bike pass. Um, and it's been talked about for many years. But it's never yeah, okay. So that that's appropriate for... And it, and it fits what it's saying at the bottom of the page, what it's looking for. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking to submit something for that for long-term planning or whatever so planning it's going to be. It may sit further down to Jenny Lynn Road yeah. or so that, Road even where the school is. That's what, I'm sorry, go ahead. So you could even push that further past this little log and actually have it go all the way down to Driver Road where the school is or down to... Uh, well, you can, Road. yeah, there's a sidewalk that was put in by, right there by Driver, right. so, you know, but this is talking about uh, reducing traffic in, in heavy areas, which, which you know, uh, La Contenda and Rancho, and so yeah, you could push it down further, um, but it meets it, it meets some of the needs that you have and pointed out here in, on points. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested in submitting that project for this. So the the at least get programmed in some type of planning stage at some part. The way to handle that is through our um, our grant programs that the you know, we took applications for. Murphy's and uh, Valley Springs and San Andreas. Um, did we have a San Andreas? Oh yeah, for Pope Street. Mm -hmm. um, so there was six COG applications and uh, certainly support anything that you want to submit for that. But that's essentially that's the external side of it. Mm -hmm. What this is talking about is what the district wants to do. So it would be a district wide issue. Also, they, they push towards, um, I would describe it, that particular money, they try to push for things that are either pilot kind of things, things that Caltrans hasn't done well in the past, and that's why things like an active transportation plan for a district 
uh, kind of pushes the envelope with that a little bit. Uh, we've left that up to the regions to do or to the you know cities to do. Um, so I cer to certainly support and I'd be happy to talk to you about what it is you want a project for, but that's more for our, um, our sustainable communities and strategic partnership grants. Well, I was looking at it as calling out for highways and it's got bike paths and things. It's calling out for to get people off of the highways and use other modes of transportation, which is mm -hmm. biking or walking or what have you. Yeah. So, and you know, that's been talked about for many years there. Mm -hmm. And it kind of fits the need to what this is talking about. So. And if I could just add, in the past, we have submitted applications, so I would recommend you work through the Public Works Director. Um, they take the identified projects to the full Board of Supervisors, they vote on it, get a, re a resolution, and then they bring it to the COG, and then we proceed a, through the process. It's actually not a bad time. I, they haven't announced the awards from the last cycle, but essentially November is, a, is approximately when those applications will be due. And um, this is a great time to start thinking about what you want to put in that pile that you want to develop those applications for. Because there's, there's nothing more frustrating in, in, in reviewing those grant applications than seeing great ideas that people came up with two months before the deadline and didn't have time to develop and a, you know, a well-developed application for. It's a great project, I can tell it's a great project, but they haven't actually, you know, it's just like getting a C minus when you had a great idea for your essay because you, you kind of didn't write a great essay. It's a good time to actually think those things through so that you have the resources to, to get those things done when the deadline comes. Weren't, weren't those applications fairly they're, they're not too bad. <laughs> they're not like they're not like the engineering applications. Okay. Yeah, the ATP is is because you're you're addressing you know safety data and benefit costs. So these these don't involve all that detail. But. Any further council comment? Any public comment for Mr. Baker at this time? Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item number 25, council reports. Look down. Question. Is it safe to assume after the governor's announcement a couple days ago that they've abandoned the per mile fuel tax it that is, I was part of? It is not. Oh, really? It is not. Mm. And I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that more when I get to my council report. Mr. Mills, you're up. Mr. Milano? Um, <clears throat> just some national stuff. Uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers released its 2017 infrastructure report card. It's a quadrant, <clears throat> quadriennial assessment of the nation's infrastructure. Uh, the national grade for the infrastructure remained at a D plus, which was the same as in 2013. <coughs> um, some of the recommendations uh, to raise these grades would be sustained infrastructure investment. This is something that Mr. Mills was touching on earlier today. Uh, bold leadership and preparation for the needs of the future. All, all things that I feel that um, are very doable. Um, we have new uh, council members and uh, I feel that they have been voicing their opinion on things uh, that would improve our infrastructure here. Um, Without doing this, uh, we're basically going to continue to deteriorate our <coughs> infrastructure to a point where we might not be able to fix it uh, with the amount of funds that uh, the country is producing. Um, I think at this point we have, we might have an opportunity in our county to, um, at least on a local level, um, rectify some of these concerns over the next couple of years. Go Finale, any council report? I have nothing. Okay. 
Um, I think you're going to end up expanding more on it, but last Friday I went down to Ontario for a League of California Sleep, and one of the top items were what you talked about with the governor making his announcement this week. Um, there was uh, talk about what the anticipation was going to be since that was Friday, and he made his announcement the following, <laughs> the following week. Um, and the majority of the cities were in support of, of these bills and pushing them through and getting the governor to sign. Um, and it's the number one hot topic for the league um, down in Sacramento to make sure that it gets through. Um, so with that, I will let John finish with. Oh, oh well, we do it. Nothing to report, so it's all yours. All right. Um, as I mentioned last month, I wanted to thank the council for their support of me being the chair. One of the privileges that I have is, is attending the California Council of Government Conference down in Monterey, and Amber and I just attended that last week. Um, one of the first things that came out, um, actually I was there earlier on Wednesday, was a pre-release of the transportation package sheet. And in answer to your question, what is currently proposed has been negotiated between Senators Bell, Assemblyman Frazier, and Governor Brown, and then expanded out to the legislature um, to uh, initially review the fact that this is a 10-year package. Um, it is not expected with the continued changes of transportation modality of electric vehicles, even more fuel efficient between hybrid uh, technology, that gas taxes can play a, a long-term role as it had in the past for funding transportation um, needs. So they, in answer to your question about the road user charge, they actually had a session on the road user charge and its status. Um, the road user charge actually had a 5,000 person study done this last year and a half. They had four different um, types of charges analyzed. Um, everything from user reported to plug-in modules to the little um, ODB2 device that's in your vehicle where they report on a simplistic basis just mileage on a more advanced basis, places driven. Um, they also looked at just time used, and they had analyzed with those four different types of charges. Um, they tried to get both a rural and an urban um, perspective on how these charges would affect people. Um, there has been a significant amount of discussion on the fact that the rural drivers seemingly are paralyzed because we, although we drive longer distances, we drive them more efficiently whereas the ones that are in the urban environment, especially in the, in the heavy traffic, are spending more time on the road and thereby impacting on a lane mile perspective, the roads more heavily, even if they only travel 10 or 20 miles in an hour versus a, a rural driver who's driven 60 miles. Um, they're looking at those dynamics, trying to now take the data they've gathered with the 5,000 individuals. The study concluded on March 31st um, they are now drafting the report to the legislature, which I believe is due at the end of this year, for potential um, recommendations in the future. Um, they are looking at both uh, Oregon heavily, because Oregon has a road user charge, and are trying to determine how that works. Um, other factors they are certainly looking at are the fact you have out-of-state drivers, how do you handle them using the use of our roads, um, and then also the impact again on how it works on the types of vehicles. So they were looking, in addition to, you would charge not just by the mile, but also by the value of your vehicle or the type of vehicle you drove. Um, because if you look at a gas tax and you drive a vehicle that gets 20 miles per gallon, you're paying twice as much as a little hybrid that's getting 40 miles to the gallon. But your, your vehicle is using the road. Now, your impact is going to be significantly less because you have a much smaller vehicle that weighs a lot less. So they're trying to understand all the parameters that would go into a road user charge. Um, they are taking their time. They are looking for a lot of different stakeholder groups to get involved in the process still, even with the report that's to come. The SB1 uh, that the governor announced last week, which is the five point, I want to say $3 billion annual um, boost to transportation, one of the first questions out of the gate when we met on Wednesday was, is there a constitutional protection that this money, all of a sudden they raise this kind of money transportation projects take a while to implement. In the past, the legislature, in order to balance its budget, has re-diverted transportation <laughs> funds collected, not yet spent. The funds explicitly raised through this transportation package are constantly constitutionally protected so that they would not get pulled away. Um, 
one of the other comments made of, you know, although it doesn't sound like much when you talk about over $5 billion, $200 million is uh, for local partnerships with what is called self-help counties. We've talked about this in the past, but we have some new folks here. A self-help county is a county that has adopted a transportation tax on top of their local sales tax, <coughs> and that is known as an aspiring or a self-help county. What we saw earlier this evening were several different examples of the ability for local money to be leveraged with, fa with federal and state monies to improve the project. Jeff brought out the fact that we had uh, $1.5 million of RIM money leveraged to get almost $16 million overall for the project construction funds on the wagon trail. There are projects that we had on our agenda tonight where I think we put up $1,600 and we're getting $50,000. The, the ratios he was talking about of a quarter percent, two and a half percent, I'm sorry, up to 25% are not unrealistic when you ask for matching funds. So if you can come with a million dollars and you got a 10% match, that's a $10 million project right there. That said, they've only allocated $200 million out of this funding to assist those counties that have adopted a self-help, a transportation tax locally to improve their local roads. And um, their local roads. Um, other sessions in this form, um, the, uh, the neat thing about the CalCog form is it's one of those types of conferences where I joked with Amber, fasten your seatbelt, these guys come fast. And they actually limited the uh, discussions to less than an hour per presentation. And all of these people could have probably spoken for an hour and a half or more just to present the meat and potatoes of what their data was. We had people speaking everywhere from um, a new startup in uh, San Francisco that is using GIS technology and doing transit route analysis. Um, they started several years ago and are now uh, global in their reach. Uh, it was fascinating to hear how they were utilizing the modeling tools that are available today on how to tweak uh, transit routes. And that was something I'd like to to share with uh, Jeff and his department. They had uh, legislative comments about the new technology that is out there. Um, for example, we've, you're hearing more and more about the automated vehicles, the vehicles that are smart enough to figure out who's to the left, right, rear, and, and in front of them. If you can get lanes of traffic with pods of these cars, they can travel more efficiently in a pod of cars than the regular human drivers. You get rid of the inchworm effect of people starting, slowing, starting, slowing, these cars can actually run closer together at higher speeds in a safe, in a safe manner. What that ramification is, is that you now increase the capacity of your highway or your, your, your mileage um, without having to build more miles. You can get more cars through faster if they have this technology. Legislatively, however, we still have the legal requirement of a vehicle following the vehicle in front of them by two seconds. So now you have legislative issues in parallel with the technical issues, and so these have to go hand in hand, and that was just the one, that's an example of what they were talking about legislatively, has to be in play with some of the technological advances that are being made. Um, they talked about um, Stanislaus County is one of the most recent counties that actually adopted a self-help uh, transportation tax, and they gave a kind of a little history and how that worked finally down there. Um, it is still a two-thirds vote, to approve a local transportation tax. They also gave the, uh, the sadness award to one local county who came at 66.4% oh. of the vote. <laughs> and you have to have 66.67. Uh, and it was literally, I think it was under 1,000 votes they said that they didn't, that lost that measure for. Uh, they talked about um, urban environment housing. And as a council of governments, when you start looking at transportation needs, you also are now looking at housing and how people are moving into cities where there is limited space. And again, older legislation that required, for example, in an apartment building, 1.5 or 2.0 parking spaces per unit. And yet you have a limited footprint to put up a, a high density building. You don't have the space to also lay out a bunch of asphalt for all this parking. But if you place that parking near transportation hubs, you may not find that your residents in these highly dense apartment type units or condo units need two spaces per unit. They may be able to get away with one or even less than one in one example that they gave. Again, these were highly, you know, urban environments. Downtown Sacramento was one. Downtown Stockton was another. They, uh, they put a, a veterans, it was a building for disabled veterans. And the original uh, requirement was like 2.4 spaces per unit. And they said, look, we're trying to help disabled veterans here. They don't have 
the need for 2.4 spaces per unit. They have a need to be near a bus system, a transit shelter, or the ability to have somebody on Uber or Lyft or uh, a transportation means come by, pick them up, and take them to where their appointment is from the VA. So they were actually able to get that exception written in. That's the type of thinking that's going on in dense environments and transportation needs, but it's, it's, it's becoming more where the Council of Governments on a California basis is now looking at housing and its needs and its impact on transportation requirements. Uh, they gave um, an interesting um, leadership lesson on Black Rock City, which is also known as Burning Man. The gal came out and gave a 40-minute presentation on how you create, build, and tear down a city in about three weeks. Uh, and the logistics of doing that, including BlackRock as a group does not provide any trash cans. They expect everyone who brings it in to bring it out. Um, so they talked about how do you handle a, that type of issue. They talked about um, how do you pulse cars into a, uh, an event that takes over 70,000 people on a two-lane road. And they actually talked about the fact that rather than just letting everybody just stay in line, stay in line, stay in line, they actually stop them and let a whole mile clear in front of you and then they'll pulse in the next group. So people don't sit there idling the whole time. They actually turn their cars off and then turn it back on, go that mile and stop again. It's more efficient. It's a transportation thing. So actually it was a, a fascinating presentation that you gave us. And I'm not trying to take too much more of your time. Um, we did have, uh, and Carl may appreciate this, a friendly word from, a friendly word from the Federal Housing um, Authority. Uh, and he gave just a, a nice comment about transportation funding in general, and the fact that uh, there is a lot of unknown right now nationally with what's going to happen uh, with the direction um, from Washington. And uh, it, right now it's a moving target. They are trying to figure out where things are going to land here in the next year. Um, I think I'll close with um, They talked about the state's climate and transportation policies and how um, greenhouse gas, California's efforts independently of the federal standards are stricter, but are demonstrably um, capable of proving improvements for our urban environments. And certainly they were citing Sacramento and Los Angeles and the Bay Area as areas where because of California's insistence on a California standard for the vehicles driven here, it's a tighter standard, it's a more restrictive standard than what the nation has in the other 49 states. And you'll, you'll see actually if you buy a car, it's either a 49 state car or it's a California car. And you can't take a 49 state car and bring it into California and have it pass smog. Um, there is talk at the Washington level today of relaxing environmental concerns for the means to advance more um, sales, maybe to take regulations off a little bit, off the load, off the manufacturers. Uh, the point being here was that when you have demonstrable improvements in the quality of life, that needs to be valued. And it was, a, it was a, again, a very challenging um, look to the future of where are we headed. Uh, the CAF standard, the corporate average fuel economy standard, uh, was discussed in that same discussion about, you know, does California want a higher one because we do have a higher standard today, SB 375. I think has a 2020 standard and then has a 2035 standard. Uh, so again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to go down there and hear um, not only where we're at today, but also um, the thinking about what California can look to for the future. Uh, it's exciting. You know, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what we can do. Uh, we have some of the best minds in the world in this state looking for technology for improvements. And I'll say this, we have it in the legislature at times as well. People are working hard to try and actually make it work, and that's good to see. Yeah, but just a question, does that mean that they're th veering away from the gas tax and instead going towards the road user charge, or are they doing both? You get a lot of smiles when people are asked that question, because that you're literally asking a question that won't be answered for 10 years, oh. at best. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the studies that they're doing now for road user charge um, they're still figuring out what they can and can't do and what's fair. They know that this um, plan that the governor came out is a 10-year package. Mm -hmm. Realistically, that's, that's not a crystal ball anymore. That's actually some hard, hard money, hard facts. 
that can be worked with. Um, the fact that it's constitutionally guaranteed to state within transportation um, alleviates concerns that are legitimate out there for the legislator to take it and put it somewhere else. Will the manufacturers have the ability to manufacture cars to the point that the automated driving vehicles take off in such a way that the, the public or the human driven vehicle um, becomes the minority to the point that it's almost obsolete. There's many different projections on when that could or may take place. Um, but the dynamic of that happening, both for public safety, keeping vehicles from running into each other, as well as the more efficient use of the roads, more efficient use of fuel, because now you're not jumping on an accelerator and then braking and jumping on an accelerator and braking. Um, there's many benefits to the automated vehicle technology that they're looking at and trying to implement today. Um, so having said that, um, I guess that's the best answer I could glean from the conference this year. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. With that, staff reports. I have nothing. Okay. You don't want to report on the party that uh, you gave Melissa? Oh, yeah, that was a big success. And I was grateful for everyone coming out and saying goodbye to her. We're going to really miss her. She did a great job. Okay, she did. Thank you. Okay. I know. <laughs> After I walk out of this uh, room, I will start crying. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's because of Jim sitting there. <laughs> no, he's my entertainment. <laughs> he keeps well, me laughing. I, I want to compliment the staff and the council. They say no good decisions are made after three hours. Our meeting tonight lasted two hours and 50 minutes. All right. <laughs> uh, the next scheduled meeting of the COG is May 3rd in these chambers at 530. Thank you. Um, oh, yeah.